Drama, how are you? Good, how are you? Very good. Uh, we, we'd ask you to come in front of the board and just talk about probably the progress at 120 Pond Street. Um, we had a discussion at the last meeting regarding the, the stone wall and the replacement of the, the, um, the original stone wall. Sure. Um, that goes back to our meeting, I think it was June 11th, Correct. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, yes. Um, you know, at the time we talked about um, kind of a combination of both the weather, the existing stone, and some mm -hmm. new stone. Yes. Um, you know, and, and the look of it now may be a little bit different. Um, so I wanted to give you the floor. Sure. And have the opportunity to address Absolutely. the board here. Sure. Um, and then maybe there might be some questions that we sure. can talk about. So what we did was we uh, dismantled the wall by hand so we could save and put aside mm -hmm. all the preferred stones, face stones, corner stones, and top stones. And unfortunately, there were a lot of rubble stones in there as well. So given the um, height that we tried to maintain, and the length, we didn't change the height at all, and the, the length is basically the same. Um, so what we did was we purchased some stones. They're called White Mountain. They're New England stones. We hand picked them. We brought in about five yards of stone. These have lichen and mildew. Um, moss, I'd say probably 90% of them have that. So um, we tried to locate all the heavier stones from the existing wall at the bottom and try to integrate the newer stones during the, uh, in the middle part of the wall in the top. So I've got some pictures and I think you'll um, see the lichen and uh, moss that we strive to uh, to apply there as yeah. far as the stones go. So um, it's, you know, it's a double faced wall. So I really couldn't, I've been at this for 50 years. It might not look like it, but it's been 50 years. And I have a lot of passion for this work. I don't take it for granted. We've been in the Globe. We've been in this old house. We received a award from the Watertown um, Watertown Historical Commission. So truly I have, as I say, I have that passion for it. And I really wouldn't want to do anything that's going to take away from the look of that street. So again, we tried to use as many weathered stone as possible um, and try to achieve a nice, tight, crisp line to it, staying, keeping that margin equal from the ground. And I have to say, I'm not bragging, please, but at least a half dozen people during the day, whether they be walkers or cyclists or even other contractors, pull over and they're very happy with it. The uh, neighbors next door, she comes over repeatedly. The neighbors across the street, same thing. Diagonally, she's come over many times. Down the street, a Dr. Bruce, I don't, really don't know him, but he made a point to stop by about a week or so ago. He talked to me for about 15 minutes about the wall. So there's a cyclist from Rentham that comes by on his bike every Wednesday, and I guess his dad was a mason. So we get into it a little bit with that. He, he can appreciate it. It's really, it's a challenge, but I didn't want to do anything as far as taking away from the aesthetics of that area. So um, I've got some pictures. Um, I, could I think we have some pictures here that were. Yeah, that, I think, were, were was that the before? I think there's That's some that's here. That's before. <coughs> Probably yeah, after before. also. Yeah, and there's a few. If they continue okay. through, you'll see some of the. I think those were all before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Going. Sure, I, mean, I, I, I went by today. Uh -huh. I mean, the workmanship looks exceptional. So that's Thank you. Kudos to you on that. Thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the questions that came up was. It does look like there's a lot of new stones. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's a balance or mix to, to your point. You know, when you dismantled the original wall, there were a lot of loose yes. stones, which were probably useless. Yes. I don't know if people use right. them or not. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why maybe the look of it has kind of a little bit newer look, which kind of, I want to say, <clears throat> is a little bit different than what the existing previous wall look mm -hmm. like, but yes. it does provide that little right. bit of a contrast. And, yes. 
I think it kind of maybe surprised, and I won't speak for all the members of the board, maybe surprised right. you a little bit. And I'll tell you, even some of the, <coughs> the existing stones, if you were to turn it over and there's a better face, and it's easier and better <coughs> to put the wall back with that particular face, then we do it. But it's going to age very quickly there. It's all oak trees and pine trees. Yeah. Plus, if there's a particular stone or two or 10 or 20 that you don't like, then what we could do is age it a little bit faster. There's four different processes you could use for that. The last one I'd rather not use. Oh, no. Which is the manure process. <laughs> <coughs> um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is there any mortar in the wall? No. No That's mortar. All dry. All dry. Yep. David. So when we discussed this at the last meeting, I would you know, I, I thought the wall looked nice. I, I didn't think there was any reason for concern. So I did go there after the meeting and take a look at, at the wall. And one thing I noticed is that, um, I think it's 126? 120. No, you're at 120, but at 126, there's oh. a wall that's almost identical to yours. So I mean, I, I think. 110. Yeah. yeah, I saw that 110, too. okay, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's right, 110. So I just want to make chicks? the point that. I'm not sure. Three chicks? Yeah. What did she say? That's the, the, That's the name of the property, Street Chicks. Oh, oh. chicken. Oh. Yeah. No, no, I'm familiar with the house. I think it used to be Tweed Apple Farm, right? Yes. Um, and, and, and I don't know if there's other questions for board members. I, you know, I think it was just kind of getting your perspective. And I think that stone, to your point, over time, will age at a probably faster than the normal rate. Yes. So it kind of looks aesthetically similar to other homes, both on Pond Street. Elm Street also has a number of homes with the, 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 the stone wall. Now, granted, right. some of those walls have probably been there for 100 plus um, years. Exactly, yes. Um, so it's not going to be an apple <coughs> to apples comparison. I, yeah, um, I think you're right. When you drive by, look at it, it looks kind of brand new, you know, which it is brand new, of course. but. Some of the lighter stones possibly jump out a little bit sooner than, than the rest. But if you kind of, even if you just walk by, you can see where there's a good amount of weathered stone there. And believe me, it was difficult to hand pick the ones that we use, but that's what we did. Uh, is there, is there, um, sorry. Yes, go ahead, please, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have not been by today, I mm haven't -hmm. earlier. Um, is there a matchup to um, sort of a more field? The, well, we, we had the, the wing walls are on the customer's property. Yes. Those are semi-dry set, so there is mortar in those, yeah. but it's scratched deeply to give the illusion that it's a dry wall. And then from the property line or before that, we start with a dry stack. And I think this gentleman asked me last time how we were going to transition right. from that to what we're currently doing. And that was the important thing. The stones came from the same place. It's a New England stone. And it's just the fact that there are more chinks or more wedges in the, in the dry stack because there's no water to hold it. So to secure it, especially where it's a double-faced wall, yeah. you have to keep that integrity going. So on the other end, though, off-property, what, what happens off-property? Um, as far as if you're facing the driveway to the right side, mm -hmm. he that's going to be a service entrance. It's a temporary entrance, but that's on his property. There's two granite pillars there. Is that what you mean? There's a very short wall going on after that, probably just four or five feet. There is a there is a dead tree that there, which is a concern of the neighbors. It's very dead. Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> Now, with the, with the um, I think the double stacking mm -hmm. that you're doing, was the existing stone wall double stacked? As no, well? the existing the existing wall was about four feet wide, and typically, as you probably know, with the farmers, when they prep their uh, crops, they dig up these stones and just stack them up. So when when you're not able to really stack them in a good way, they would start the wall probably four feet wide, and then it would shrink up to two feet wide. So there was no, I just tried to maintain that same width, two feet plus on that, just to have the integrity of the original wall. Yeah, to be able to do that. So I think that that's where I got hung up. I think that I had a vision that um, it would look like the old farm or small. 
Yeah. So, you know, I really appreciate you coming in. Oh, sure. Um, answering our questions. Sure. Yeah. And, um, I think it's just a lesson to us to make sure that we know that we're, we're we have the same vision. Oh, absolutely. I, I can understand your concern because it is a beautiful street. I mean, as far as people walk, there's a ton of walkers there, cyclists and all that. So I can I can appreciate it. And I think for us, to your point, Madam Chairman, it's it's a learning lesson as you know, future applicants come in front of us will tell something similar, understanding double stacking, understanding of the percentages of old stone versus new stone to kind of, I think to her point, maintaining the, that look and feel while yeah. meeting the needs of your customer or client uh, and, the, and you as an applicant in front of this board. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, things like, um, you know, you mentioned no mortar, which they don't, I guess, right. no to, yeah. to you there, you know, trying to look for the majority of the old stone relative to the new stone. Mm -hmm. um, and this similar to that kind of facade, right? Now the, the original wasn't double stacked, it was that four feet went to two and you've got that double stack. So right. I think as, as we understand that, you know, going forward, um, I think we're comfortable. So again, uh, the, the work being done, it looks fantastic. Thank you. I Thanks. wish you the best of luck. So unless there's other questions from the board, I think you know, some of the lessons learned that have been Amy? I just wanted to comment. He mentioned there's some artificial processes you can do to make them age um, better, but I think I'm comfortable with letting it age naturally. I, I, I don't know. I agree. So we weren't, we weren't, I'd probably test it before we did it because <coughs> I wouldn't want the na natural effect to be resisted by something that's synthetic, shall we say. Um, but again, on that street, it's a method oak, pine trees, maple trees, right overhead, which was great in the month of July because it provided us with a lot of shade. So that part was good. But it will age quickly, believe me. Very good. Mm -hmm. No further questions, uh, Madam Chair, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Absolutely. No, no, thank you. Sure, well, thank you very much. <coughs> You're not able to put up something will be emailed to Three minutes. No, because I have to put it on a USB uh, so drive. Uh -oh. Oh. There were some blanks for the number of voters, and oh, and it was assumed. Although I spoke, I spoke out about um, one of the issues that I voted no, and I actually voted yes, even though I said something bad. All right. Okay, well, definitely, definitely. So I'll just make sure to get to you, get with you, and correct that. Okay. Anybody else? I found no typos. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Location, the superintendent's office. I actually, oh, it's at the office, yes. I know in the past, Madam Chairman, the, the superintendent has come in front of this board and talked about growth, and they've had a spreadsheet in the past. I don't know if 
Does anybody remember? I'm looking around, it's not too many old faces, but <laughs> they've had a spreadsheet in the past which had kind of like the last few years and then projected in the future. So that might be a good document yeah. to. to yeah, and I actually asked Georgia this past week if, if we could get a new one. We had one from 2017 that lists all the housing units that were either existing or approved, or let's see, either already approved or in, in progress, yeah. kind of yeah. not quite approved yet, yeah. with the number of housing units, the number of bedrooms. Does, it does seem to make sense that it would be a topic of conversation for the board and, you know, in collaboration with the school committee and the school department. Thank you. There's one of the things on the top of my mind is how that was going to be Well, handled. the school department and the superintendent and all of the credit are initiating this meeting. So um, anyway, I will report back what, what we discussed and hopefully they can come in. Um, so I will entertain a motion to open the continued public hearing for 1700 Wilson Street, Zero Cedar Street, commercial solar photovoltaic special permit application. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Shall we invite them in? Yes. Did you have a light on? Get some more. Thank you. Oh, I'm Call back. Us. Call it in and say it. I'm back. Chris. <clears throat> I'm so glad I have three. <clears throat> I want to screw them up like that. Welcome. We've already opened the public hearing, so we are ready when you are. Good evening. My name is Christopher King with Atlantic Design Engineers, and uh, we're back before you this evening on behalf of TGA Solar for the Wilson Street Solar Project. Uh, when we were last before you, we had some outstanding issues, which we've submitted some revised information with plans, landscape plans. Uh, preservation plan, which we feel address the uh, concerns outlined last time. Um, if I go through them bullet by bullet for just time, and then if uh, you need further clarification on anything I've presented, feel free to um, you know let me know. Um, landscaping, uh, as far as alternative screening goes, uh, we are requesting a uh, finding from the board uh, regarding the buffer width along the, sh the northern border of the Shambo property. Um, what we've done is we've revised the landscape plan, um, added uh, pretty detailed notes, and broken the areas out into several different areas, uh, depending on the need for alternative screening. Um, the Shambo portion of the property, we're reclaiming a, a roughly a 10,000 square foot area of lawn and basically um, reforesting it, if you will, um, taking that back and uh, doing our best to increase the buffer <coughs> along that property line. Uh, we've extended plantings along the northerly, northerly edge of that and extending down to the south to a point that um, we had discussed with the homeowner that we thought would provide effective screening. Um, to the north for the Cutter property, again, we've uh, strung uh, a row of plantings up and along the entire northern edge of the um, array for the most part extending to a point where we feel would cover any potential uh, visual impacts from the Cutter property. Uh, there were some specific areas where Mr. Cutter had some concerns on some high points and so we made an effort to actually pulled the panels back a little bit and allowed for some increased screening in that particular area. Uh, we've also added a black vinyl coated chain link fence for a portion of the property particularly that goes along the Cutter property to the north, Wilson Street, and then the Shambo property to the east. Um, so uh, as far as landscaping goes, you know, the plan in front of you proposes um, in excess of 600 trees and shrubs, um, and we feel that the uh, alternative screening provided uh, would put the board in a position to uh, make a favorable determination that it's um, adequate based on, you know, this particular instance. So just for the public's um, information, what will the buffer be? What, how, ma what is the proposal? How, uh, how many feet is it? Uh, it's, I mean, we keep 75 feet with exception to the Shambo property where the existing tree line is kind of an odd shape as you can see on the plan. And so we are increasing it in excess of 75 feet in some areas, but in some areas it kind of tails off, uh, and that's really due to the existing cart path that is already in there uh, with an established tree line. Yes. Yeah, what is the narrowest? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, you understood my question. I understood yours. <laughs> So while well, I try to pull that measurement, um, it's down here, right? is area. screening has also been added in and around the um, so entrance to, to right Wilson here, Street. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, as it's been previously discussed, our interconnection right now is currently proposed along Wilson Street. And um, we've submitted additional information. Uh, we've actually gone and done another pre-app with the utility. Uh, to ascertain the feasibility of interconnecting on Cedar Street and the information provided still identifies a number of fatal flaws in that infrastructure. Um, so to uh, speaking to some of the concerns we've heard, we've uh, gone ahead and, and relocated everything for the interconnection along Wilson Street to underground infrastructure. It would be a series of <coughs> cabinets uh, on equipment pads and then we would have a final underground run to the pole across on the eastern side of Wilson Street for our point of interconnection. So just a question related to that to the yeah, chair. Did you say you'd be going underground? Yes. Because at the last meeting, I think you said you were going over, over top. The yeah. So there's a change? Yes, okay. we changed it to underground and the node on the plan specifically requires that and provides coordination with the DPW to make sure that the work is, is Thank you. done in accordance with their standards. I'm just still curious to hear what that yeah, measurement, measurement is. Grab it. One second. <clears throat> so at the very f entrance to the project at Wilson Street, the narrow part of the buffer is 20 feet. Okay. And again, that's due to the tree line associated with a cut for the cart path. As you go to the west uh, with the reclamation and the alternative screening, we increase it to roughly 80 feet at its widest, and then it tapers back down to you know, about 20 feet again where the <coughs> existing tree line swoops in uh, due to the cart path alignment. That's another question. Please. You can, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned fatal flaws with connecting uh, on Cedar Street. Can you elaborate on what those fatal flaws are? Sure. utility system modifications it's a number of different things but the majors the existing infrastructure would require significant modifications um, that would stretch for five miles to the nearest substation um, and again this is prepared by an electrical engineer is a little bit out of my area of expertise um, but they've identified a fatal flaw with the interconnection um, to one of the circuits on Cedar Street uh, due to a stiffness factor and the modifications that would potentially be required. It's on page 60 of our okay. Thanks, page 60. 60. Can, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Georgia to just uh, walk us through the process after this permit, if we approve it, what happens next for the connection? Because there is another hearing process. Yes, so um, there is the smaller caveat of the road opening permit that DPW does require, which is way further down the line. Um, but there also is a pole and wire location petition that you have to file with the Board of Selectmen. So that would, in this case, be the utility company, not the applicant. Um, so for if it would be Eversource. So that uh, petition goes to the Board of Selectmen. They hold a public hearing. Um, there's an application process, better notifications. Um, so it's really a review for public safety and aesthetics. That's what the board really looks at. Um, so following this, there's another set of approvals from the Board of Selectmen that are required. 
for the interconnection itself. For the interconnection point. So that's really, it's required for any erect poles, abutments, conduits, piers, anything like that within the public right of way. Do you want to keep going and then I'll let you come back to it, Gary? So go ahead, Chris. Sure. And so <clears throat> landscaping, the interconnection, um, another one of our um, major changes was due to the um, presence of Native American ceremonial stone landscapes. Um, so um, the board had requested additional information, and so we went right to the experts and hired uh, Mr. Doug Harris um, with the um, Historic Preservation Office for the Narragansett Indian Tribe. Um, he and uh, with um, several other members of, of um, the Aquinnah Wampanoag Tribe, and then as, as well as their mapping firm, uh, CLR, visited the site, um, and we walked just about every 10 square foot of the site. Um, we're actively GPS mapping locations, and so we've come up with a preservation plan, which we've submitted to you folks. Um, just this afternoon, um, we were negotiating kind of just to make sure that everyone was on the same page and basically terms, if you will, um, based on the areas identified and the preservation efforts being taken forth. And so we've um, more or less rearranged the array within the previous footprint you've already been reviewing and just staggered some panels, removed some panels in some areas to either avoid formations, preserve sight lines, or preserve um, the shadowing of some of these formations. Um, there's a large area to the south off our Cedar Street subarray, which I, was identified as a ceremonial hill landscape. And so that gets a little tricky where, you know, right off the bat, we revised the grading in that area. Um, to not, previously we were cutting roughly 10 feet off of the top of the hill, so we've eliminated regrading any of the hill on the formation. Um, our intent is to come up with a custom racking system that would basically allow us to put as many panels in that area without impacting um, the hillside and, and, and doing it in a manner that's amenable to the tribe. Um, and we've gone through, uh, like I said this afternoon, and come up with a set of conditions that where Attorney Pacella will read off and recommend that the planning board include, hopefully as a condition, as additional conditions of approval um, that will um, set forth steps um, moving forward that will ensure that that happens. A project like this, typically the racking system is pretty conventional. It's co pretty cookie cutter. It's a very unique situation where racking systems for something like this probably do not exist and will, will require a significant amount of engineering, <coughs> structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, and so that's going to be done at, during the, after the procurement process has started, the racking system is selected, they get paid and they start working on it. And so, again, the conditions that Attorney Pacella stepped through basically will allow the tribe to finish doing their survey, more detailed mapping, and um, evaluation of the, each of the features and their significance, if you will. It'll identify areas of um, potential effect um, and then identify the preservation efforts for those areas. Um, once that's completed, we'll basically be submitting that information, if you will, to the racking engineers. They'll come up with a plan which um, one of the conditions would be that plan be provided back to not only the town but the tribes prior to the issuance of the building permit. And then on top of that, during con select construction activities in these areas, not throughout the duration of construction, but cer certain activities in certain periods of time, the tribe or its designee will be a construction monitor to make sure that the areas are preserved in accordance with um, the conditions and everything that's outlined. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank you for doing a very thorough job on this um, this particular piece of the plan that came up um, sort of deep into your project planning. So I appreciate that. Um, go ahead. There's just one last component, no, not to, uh, last but least. Um, so as part of this, we've had a, not a significant redesign, but a redesign of the drainage. And so mm -hmm. I had submitted some initial information to Beta. Um, <coughs> Phil Paradis, who's here, requested some additional information this morning 
I had given it to him. Um, it's, it's strictly technical and I'm, there may be a little bit of a tweak here or there, but the intent of the stormwater design is still holds true where we're not increasing peak flows. Um, and I'm confident that um, Atlantic could work with beta and provide compliance with, from a stormwater standpoint. Um, and hopefully that wouldn't hold the board up this evening from, from rendering a decision. Okay. Phil, do you want to give us a, a little update or do you have? Uh, yeah, just real quickly, uh, what uh, Chris said was true about the, especially the impact for the, the Southwest um, kind of array system <coughs> is that they had, they had initially shown it being regraded. Now that, they, now that they're not going to regrade it, there's, there's some sections on it that's pretty steep. Mm -hmm. And so um, from, from what I know of solar arrays, they can, they can be installed up to uh, grades of 20%. And you've got some grades are close to 50% there. So, so he's going to have to, you know, uh, massage it a little bit to, to see how many um, arrays he can get in. But also because he's not going to grade it, he, he can't install this the swale that was uh, proposed on the, on the south property line. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's going to be some changes to the, um, to the drainage. Um, he did provide additional calcs. I wasn't, uh, I didn't agree with them initially. So I, I don't think it's a huge change, uh, but I think it can be worked out. Um, but I, I don't think that we're com completely there yet, so. Okay. Any questions for Phil before he? Okay. Um, in the conditions that you have that you're going to go over, do you include um, all the monitoring and so forth during construction that the, the tribe is going to be able to do? Is that part of your, yes. what you're going to, okay. Okay, did you want to, are you, want to continue or? Um, that was, that was it for my portion, if you will. If you um, prefer, I could certainly go over the conditions that we've, uh, that we've agreed to, um, and then really just kind of open it up to answer any questions or any outstanding issues. Um, I feel like I've kind of hit everything. I know it was kind of a quick um, review, um, but again, if you need additional detail in regards to any either any of those talking points, I could certainly clarify. Through the chair, can I? Yeah. Just going back to the uh, interconnection. Um, and I appreciate the analysis that you guys did on the potential for the, the Cedar Street, but I'm wondering if, if they did the same analysis on the Wilson Street connection. I, I'm just curious to see how the numbers compare on Wilson Street compared to Cedar Street in particular with regards to stiffness and capacity. I know that they did when this project first came to fruition, and that's what drove them to select Wilson Street. Um, I don't have that information um, available with me. Um, but they did do the same analysis, um, and it was determined that Wilson Street um, was a better candidate. And I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm sure it has to do with the, the capabilities of the existing infrastructure, probably capacity, and then where the feeder is ultimately going to go and the immediate need they have to fill. Um, but again, that's kind of performed out of house, if you will, as far as in my area of expertise. And, and one more question. So this analysis was done by LNG consultants? Correct. And they were paid on your behalf? Uh, I believe they were hired by TJ, correct. Okay. And they were hired to take a look at the latest pre-application report that's generated by Eversource for TJ. Um, and so they take a look at that and probably some other things um, that they have access to and then basically offer a recommendation based on the pre-app report. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Um, I was going to wait until after they went through the conditions. For me to... uh, I'm just as happy to wait for the conditions at the end, but if you want to do them now, we can. Does everybody want to hear the conditions at this point that they propose to add? It's fine. Uh, so these are these are um, we're 
finalized this afternoon, so I don't have them typed for the board, and I'm happy to provide them. Uh, this, I'm going to read it word for word because it's very important. And I know Doug Harris is present as well, I can tell you, uh, who is the medicine man and deputy tribal historic preservation officer for the Mary Ganton Indian tribe of Rhode Island. And we also worked with Jonathan Perry of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedekina. Um, so there are previously identified areas of concern of Native American, indigenous, ancestral, cultural resources on the project. As such, the Hopkinton Planning Board is asked to impose the following conditions of approval. One, or you know, this would be one letter, or maybe, maybe these, are, these are letters instead. But uh, one, uh, on behalf of the applicant, the tribes, and I'm referring to the two I just mentioned, will complete the survey to identify the features and any associated alignments within the area of potential effect of any cultural resources and to determine what impact avoidance plan will be necessary. Two, in areas identified as requiring protection, the engineering of the wrapping system and associated infrastructure will be designed to protect and preserve the integrity of the identified cultural resources. Three, a final engineering plan shall be provided to the planning board and the tribes at least seven days prior to filing for a building permit. Number four, the tribes or their designated representatives will be present as construction monitors during tree clear clearing to be allowed by hand and installation of wrapping systems and associated infrastructure for compliance and to identify any petroglyphs, remains, or new cultural resources to be preserved or protected we didn't put the words in, but after the land's cleared. So if they find something while they're clearing this one particular area, then they, they work to preserve. Is, uh, and that's the total? That's the total. Okay, all right. Um, perhaps um, the, the experts could come forward too. And Thank you for being here. Please just uh, identify yourself for the board and the public. Uh, I'm Doug Harris, Deputy Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Narragansett Tribal Historic Preservation Office. My specialization is as preservationist for ceremonial landscapes. And I would like to make a correction. I am not the medicine man. Uh, <laughs> it's a uh, spiritual weight that I'm honored not to carry. <laughs> and. Um, he is John Brown, and uh, he has recently taken that position. It was his uncle who is the elder medicine man, Lloyd Running Wolf Wilcox. Uh, John Brown is also the um, tribal historic preservation officer, and I'm one of his deputies. It's truly an honor to be here tonight. Um, it's, I'm honored that you all have cared enough about the prehistory of your town to look out for that prehistory, uh, those things that were left by our ancestors. Uh, and I say our ancestors because the multiple tribes have chosen not to take possession of these, but to acknowledge that they are from a time period where uh, the tribes as they exist today may not have existed. Uh, and I'd also like to thank um, these gentlemen um, and their client for opening the possibility where we can have a collaborative relationship to protect what is ancient there and assist you in protection and preservation. So Attorney Priscilla, thank you. Thank you. Mr. King, thank you. And I'd like to thank this gentleman who is from your town for um, Mr. Haskins um, sent me photographs and asked the question, are these tribal? And my answer was, heck yes, they are. As it has happened in many places, people have asked the right question. And we, I'm honored to say, have been able to give them the right answers and to protect many places from the destruction that has happened out of ignorance in the past. So I thank you. 
What questions do you have for me? Anybody have any questions for our expert? Okay, when dealing with um, historic landscapes um, of such a sensitive nature, to what degree um, do you feel is necessary for the tribe to maintain? How, how do you, how do you make that call? Well, the first United South and Eastern Tribes Resolution on Ceremonial Stone Landscapes was crafted in 2002. Um, tribes began to recognize that being silent was only contributing to the destruction of ceremonial stone features. Our choice in the past was not to say anything with the expectation if people didn't understand what they were dealing with, the few that might be lost to the presumption that Irish monks or um, space aliens <coughs> or farmers had created these might be enough to protect them. Well, that's no longer the case. They're being destroyed at an increasing rate because of ignorance. So what do we expect? We expect, as we projected in that 2002 resolution, number 2003-22, one of the things that we set forth was that we wish to partner with towns that had the responsibility, had the jurisdiction over these places. And it has taken us until now to get to the point where we trust that that was the right decision in that resolution. And so we've started a process of reaching out to towns and asking towns to partner with our tribes because our tribes under federal guidelines have a number of responsibilities and rights but in, at the level of town jurisdiction, we have no responsibilities or rights at all. We can't come across your border and tell you to do anything. As fellow human beings, we can come to your border and we can ask you to take responsibility for that that is important to us. And that's essentially what we've begun the process of doing over the last two years requesting memorandums of understandings with towns, with our tribes, with a plan that we have already submitted to the National Register that identifies what ceremonial stone landscapes are and how they ought to be protected. We are asking you to protect and preserve what is within your jurisdiction that is precious to us. We have no right to come across your border and demand anything of you. So, through the chair, I have a follow-up mm -hmm. question to that. Um, and I'm curious, I guess, two-part question. How, how common are these um, um, ceremonial stones? Ceremonial stones. And, and as I think of future developments, what do you recommend for us to, it, because we don't have a process that necessarily has someone come in to check, and given these are our private property, and there could be issues with trespassing or, or other things for you to go on their land. I'm curious if you have any recommendations to ensure that that this kind of thing, that the, the risk of this happening does, doesn't happen here in Huffington. Well, I've identified ceremonial stones at the request of the U.S. Forest Service in Alabama, Talladega National Forest. I've had conversations with the um, supervisor of the um, uh, Washita National Forest in Arkansas. He says they're, they're there. I've seen them in, in Pennsylvania. I've seen them in New York State. I've talked with Yurok in Northern California, and they inform me that they have ceremonial stones there. I've talked and I've seen pictures in Colorado. They are pervasive. This was a part of our ancient cultural system. And these have been mistaken 
presumably because Indians were presumed to be too savage and too uncivilized to have a relationship that could identify an alignment of stones to events in the cosmos. It's our belief system that the stones are placed because our ancients, in doing prayers to our mother the earth, would speak a prayer into a stone and place it on the earth mother's bosom, asking her to bring forth balance and harmony. In some instances, they would also lay out stones that communicated with some of her relatives. Some of those bodies that are a part of the astronomy of our, our understanding today. But what should be done, we would recommend, is that each town have a survey done to map the ceremonial stone zones within its jurisdiction and then preserve and protect those. We can assist you, we can consult with you, we can give you guidance, we can tell you when in fact, nope, that is a, farm, a farmer's work. And um, if in fact we find Scottish or Irish stonework um, from a few thousand years ago, uh, we will try to identify that and acknowledge that. My belief is that if a Scotsman comes here today and he puts down stone features that are in his tradition or in her tradition, in 50 years by American law, those are eligible for the National Register. I would want to leave that open. I would not want us to claim anything that in fact is not ancestrally ours. But we reach out to you and we ask you to work with us in identifying what is ancestral in this area, in your jurisdiction, and we would ask you to do the work to protect it. Beyond that, <clears throat> and I'm probably speaking a little <laughs> prematurely because I don't have full concurrence with other tribes, we're also looking at the possibility that if, in fact, you have protected zones of ceremonial stone landscapes, that we can assist you in developing tourism packages so people can come and witness protected ceremonial stone landscapes that are ancestral to us. And that means that your local gas station, your local restaurant, your local bed and breakfast can make a few extra dollars from the people who want to come and see what it is that you have unified with tribes to protect. Does that generally answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Question. Yes. Uh, sir, given the fact that you went on the survey walk, are you comfortable with the changes or modifications that the applicant has, Chris and the team have made, as well as the additional conditions of satisfaction that the attorney has outlined here uh, as part of this project? Well, as I'm sure he would agree, the process is not complete. We've initiated a survey, but we have not fully examined um, every yard, every foot of that property. We have found some spectacular things, some exciting things. In a few instances, I've seen some things that I have not witnessed elsewhere. Now that's the limit of my knowledge. Uh, and we have these on the Narragansett Indian Reservation in Charlestown, Rhode Island. And as I was explaining earlier, um, we surveyed and mapped those that are on the reservation. Before starting that process, I went to an elder who was a hunter who had hunted all over New England. And I said, if, if anyone in the reservation would know about these, he would. I asked him questions, and he stared blankly at me like I was speaking a foreign language. When we finished, the mapping, I came back to him to share with him what I now knew from the empirical evidence of mapping. And he began to tell me all of what it was that I was telling him. And I said, why didn't you share this with me when I came to you? 
he said, you weren't ready. So I found now that at 70 years of age, there's some things that I'm just not ready for, or at least not to be have them shared with me until I have knowledge myself. Can I ask you um, when the survey is expected to be complete? Well, uh, as soon as you all establish that this project can move forward and we can work out the, the final details, um, we would prefer that it start um, after the leaves have fallen because it's a lot harder to, uh, to observe these when in fact you've got uh, full trees and, and uh, briar growth and, and, and such as that. But, um, the process that we've been engaging in with um, this project proponent's uh, legal and engineering team has been a very amicable one. They understand what it is that we're attempting to protect and they are working with us thus far to make sure that a process is put forward where that protection occurs. And I could just, for the, for the, for the boards, um um, application, I can tell you that, that these were worked out uh, with both Jonathan Perry and Doug Harris present, uh, and that essentially what it does is it strategically puts the, um, um, the, the, the determination and uh, for impact avoidance plan on uh, exclusively with the tribes, and then we react to that because you don't have the engineering in advance of, of, of this decision. And, the other thing I would add is, is um, we, we're not asking for a further meeting to update the plans, to provide specific locations, and, and sort of make a finalized version with uh, uh, consideration to both tribes' insistence that this not be, be that, that the, the, nature, the public nature of this be minimized to avoid potential vandalism. They, they would prefer that if we are going to, if for instance, if the board wanted uh, to get the final plan, they would ask that it be filed with the historic commission who can keep that, they have a provision that allows them to keep that confidential from public record. And so that's why we're not um, proposing to have more time to revise the plan to, 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 to give a final set of what's going to be protected and how is, is at their request. Um, I just have one comment on the conditions. For my purposes, I would prefer that everywhere the word, word cultural appears, it also it includes and or historic. We acknowledge that we too have a history <laughs> and it predates colonial history. Yes. And in the law, historic means from colonial times. But you're absolutely right. Um, there is an indigenous history here that goes back thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. We believe that, um, and we're learn we've learned much of that from the work that's been done with wind turbines out on, on the uh, ocean. Going back 24,000 years ago, the geological record identifies that the outer continental shelf was an open and vegetated plain. We challenged the process of what was going on out on the ocean because we had oral history that went back at least 15,000 years ago that said that at least 15,000 years ago, the ancient villages of the Narragansett were out where the ocean is now. That was told to me more than 20 years ago by my elder medicine woman who rest her soul is on her journey. But um, we now believe based upon the dialogues that we have had with the oceanographers that the reason we don't have glacier in our tribal oral history is because we never experienced the glacier. When that inhospitable time came in the multiple cycles of glacier, we proceeded along with the other animals, mammals, out to where living was a lot easier. That was out to the continental shelf. And we lived out where the mammals, the seals, um, and other fish were. <clears throat> and so 
when the glaciers came, we advanced out in front of the glaciers, and when they retreated, we retreated back with them. And we maintain that we have been here not just for a few thousand years, but since time immemorial. That our ancient people are the people of this land, that we did not start out in Old Vey Gorge in Kenya or Tanzania, as the leaky theory assumes that all human beings started there. What our elders have told us is that we started here. And until an elder comes forward and says, that's not so, that's what I'm stuck with. <laughs> so I'd just I like to personally it. thank you. This has been um, a real gift to uh, us, this board and the town. It's wonderful to hear from you. And I really appreciate the work that you've put in so far and, and, the, um, and the, the learning we have been entitled to do tonight. So thank you. Well, Hopkinton may be the place that <clears throat> is remembered as the place where tribes came together with the, the descendants of the colonists and they came together with new industries like solar energy and did the right thing. We thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, around the board, do we have um, additional questions before we open it up to the public? for Doug Harris. Oh, okay. oh sorry. I mean, um, I guess one of my questions to you would be with working with these people, they're going to be disturbing some things. Yeah. And as a collective finding of a large, this is, you know, this is a tough decision for you alone. As a collective finding of all these wonderful pieces of rock that mean so much, are they going to disturb or be destroyed even in the touching or the pervasiveness of, the, of, of, the, of that property, of, of the requirements of the solar panels? Well, <clears throat> we recognize that human beings and progress are bound together. The best that we can do is to have agreements where we monitor what happens, we prescribe what should happen, and that we make sure that there is no destruction where destruction can be avoided. We will create with the project proponent an avoidance report, an impact avoidance report from that will be developed an impact avoidance plan. Um, and if it was left to me, there would be no destruction. If it was left to me, places would be left alone, which is the spirit of what I'm sensing and what you're, you're asking. But we are human beings. And even with our ancestors, progress was a part <coughs> of their way of life. The human being of today may be galloping far too rapidly toward progress, but to the extent that we and you can slow that down so that as little as possible is destroyed of what is ancient, then we are attempting to do that. So, but I have a question. Um, we are a, a board of um, relatively educated, talented people, and we are here to protect you, protect Hopkinton, protect um, historic elements in town. We're not meant as a sort of a, an avoidance of, of progress. We, we deal with it every day or every meeting we have um, to try to promote and invite the proper development of our town. My question to you would be, do you think that you want to work with the builder and the developer solely without the support of our historic wisdom or our perhaps suggestions? 
however minor they might be. Deb, I don't understand the question, to be honest. So my question is, you're, what they're asking you to do is to go off and develop a plan. We're, we're approving the plan as it is. We don't know what that plan, is that what we're doing? So, so let me just. That's what I'm saying. Let, let me I, just what, make it clear. Okay. We've memorialized what they've asked us to do. Okay. This is in our language. This is they would normally in a federal project, they would do a survey. So okay. we've, the operative language has come from the tribes, and this is their way of protecting everything because <coughs> that that comes first. Their okay. survey comes first before any construction before any engineering. Then the engineering comes behind the survey, goes through them again, okay. um, and then we would file for the building permit and then proceed. And so it, it, this is, this is the, the procedure that uh, uh, was intended to be uh, a broad and delegated to the tribes mm -hmm. to, to, it becomes part of the order because as the conditions are added to the, uh, if, there's a, if there's an approval with conditions, they do have your assistance, which continues because we have to comply with this. And their, their remedy, if there was a compliance when monitoring, would be alert the, the building inspector, the planning board, and there'd be a cease and desist at a public hearing. So, so, it, so it, it's not like we leave and there's no, and, and it's, it's for us to fight it out it, oh, it, I don't it, mean. Yeah. No, no, but I'm just saying, like, it. it I'm it just trying to find because you have been developing your plan rather fastidiously, and 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 in order for it to make economic sense, you need to lay out what. So, you Deb, need I'm going to remind you. You ask your questions oh, through the chair. That's okay. I just don't want to debate to ensue. No, I'm not debating. Yep. I'm just trying to figure out how those negotiations are going to go. If if the plan that we approve. Is going to change. Yeah, I understand. I understand that piece of the question, and I it's so it's in my well, head as well. A, yeah, will there be a time when when they're required to come back after these things have been done, and can we suggest that? Okay. That's what my question. All right. Anybody? I I'll I, pin in that question. Okay. Anybody else have questions in particular? I do. Okay. So I'm going to write the I'm going to write that one down so I don't forget it. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm satisfied with the um, how how the plan is is proposed to go forward with the ceremonial stone features. I had a question um, and includes Chris um, uh, regarding the um, um, the screening. Um, I in the minutes from 827 there was there was mention of of the screening for the people across the street and the views and I, I did not feel that that was fully addressed. I just I feel, felt like we skipped over it and it just, you know, it wasn't addressed. Um. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember exactly which hearing it first came up with, but uh, months ago we had met on site with, we had let the abutters know and we had, um, spearheaded it through one of the homeowners and met on site with the applicant. Mr. Shambo was there, Mr. Cutter was there, um, Ms. Hanowitz was there as well. And we walked the various properties to identify potential sight lines. Um, and, um, you know, possibly Ms. Hanowitz could confirm this, but uh, my recollection is that when we walked up her driveway and turned around to look, it was determined that additional screening was not required um, due to the fact she has roughly 100 feet of forest between her clear lawn area and Wilson Street, um, and that the obviously we're going to need alternative screening for the Chambeau property, and that in combination with the reforestation of the frontage along Wilson Street to aid in the screening from that, <coughs> excuse me, from that visual impact made additional screening up on the properties across the street uh, not needed. Okay. Um, as and that- in, As in the view of any solar panels is obscured. Correct. With the current screening. Correct, and I'm pretty sure that, again, I don't want to speak for her, but I'm pretty sure the homeowner was there and <coughs> agreed to it because when we started this whole process 
we would have implemented alternative screening there too. Again, the applicant is trying to do the right thing where we're of course are providing alternative screening for the Chambeau property because that's where we require our favorable finding from the board. The Cutter property, we maintain the 75 foot buffer we're required under the special, under the, the solar bylaw. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we just are, again, going above and beyond around every corner to really try to speak to the concerns we're hearing from the board. And, Again, not to be redundant, but looking across the street, the sheer distance and the distance they're set back from Wilson Street and the amount of existing forest remaining makes screening over there, I think, a little bit out of, um, out of the obligations of the applicant. And in addition to the fact that there, there aren't any visual holes in that area. Okay. Yeah, I think that there, there perhaps was you know, as reflected in the minutes, it, it, it seemed to skew more toward it's not a responsibility rather than, but the view is not going to be a problem <laughs> um, because the screening is there. So, um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Because, sure. You know, they, are, they are still abutters, <laughs> even though they're not right next to it. Um, so, and I think that that, that addresses it. Um, so I, in terms of the connection, um, the Cedar Street versus, and what Gary had asked about um, the analysis from the electrical engineers, I looked through some of the past materials packets and I could not find any of the, I, it, that doesn't mean they're not there, <laughs> but I looked over the last couple of months worth and I couldn't find the analysis from the Cedar Street versus Wilson Street side. It's just. No, I think that, that we, we did not have that. Okay. Um, and, and I do understand from, from what you said previously that Wilson Street, if the connection is on Wilson Street, no wires are going overhead to the other side of Wilson Street. It's all in the underground. Correct. Okay. Um, and final thing was lot clearing, and that's the entire development, lot clearing. Um, it has been raised in the past, um, I think, by some abutters, but I wanted to uh, understand where you stood in terms of um, uh, being able to do this in a phased way, such that the entire development isn't clear, clear cut right at the beginning. And then, and then it, I know you're building in phases, because you, know, you have to, and it makes sense to. Um, but where, where were you, do you stand on that? What was your plan? Uh, typically, we address once the site contractor is selected um, prior to the issuance of the building permit. We'll submit um, uh, for this um, for the SWIP, and so that will typically identify construction sequencing and phasing that's specific to the site. Um, I do know that typically operations don't like to keep remobilizing, so they'll do as much that makes sense. Um, but a site like this is challenging, as Mr. Paradis from Beta has also brought up, where, you know, phasing it in portions is probably going to make sense, but I can't speak specifically for the means and methods for the contractor that's selected. Um, but they do have a set of regulations that they need to adhere to to make sure they aren't causing detriment um, either to the wetlands or any adjacent property, and that would be, um, that would be addressed during that portion. That's something we can do for conditions. Mm -hmm. I can recommend it. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> That's it for me. Yeah. Um, I am going to recommend that we hear from um, the public at this point. Um, just for everybody's information, our next public hearing um, is not going to take the full um, 45 minutes that's allotted. So I think that we're going we're gonna to somehow adjust <coughs> um, how we do this so we can complete the discussion on this tonight if it's possible. Okay, so Thank if you. there are any members of the public who would like to make comments at this time. Sorry, ask about the buffering, or do you want to wait till after? So, uh, Amy, I, I think that we're going to have to open the next public hearing and then hopefully take care of them because it's going to be abbreviated um, and then come back to. But definitely hold on to your question. Hi. Hi, Susan Hanowich. I live at 14 Wilson Street. So I was one of the residents that um, Chris made reference to. So I think if any of you 
live in a neighborhood where there's trees around and it's summertime. The trees are pretty lush and you really probably can't see a lot of maybe your neighbors or unsightly things because it's summertime. So as the trees fall and things become more sparse, uh, then you might have a vision of other things that you might not want to see. So I guess I am concerned that because my property is directly <coughs> across from the solar um, farm at this point that the trees look okay, but come winter time, what will that look like? So um, I know right now I don't want to misrepresent that it, it would, you would probably see it, but I think come winter time you might see the solar panels. So I'm glad you actually brought m that to my attention to just at least make reference. I think the other thing that's very concerning is that when you look or talking about the connections, just as um, a resident in the town, I don't think the, the answers are really clear why Cedar Street and why Wilson Street's been picked. Uh, I think you actually looked through your notes and there hasn't really been a good comparison as to why. So I think that really needs to be addressed. And you really, I know it's an electrical, complicated thing, but I think we need to kind of figure that out just to make sure that we all understand that we really know the facts. And I guess lastly, I'm appealing to you I mean, it's the intellect and it's the emotional. And I've lived in Hopkinton over 30 years. I love the town. And Wilson Street is a scenic road, and that's the emotion. What's this going to look like after? I'm hoping that you guys you know, do your job, because that's, that's what we're entrusting you to do, to make sure that it really remains that same feeling. It's really, really important. So. The town has changed, and I realize that. But um, it's your job to really make sure that the integrity is kept intact. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, Tom, come on up. Thank you. My name's Tom Shambo. I live at 15 Wilson Street. Been in town since uh, February of 1992, and at Wilson Street since July of 1995. Um, I don't know how Mr. DePetri came about acquiring the property that we've been talking about here, but as I started out the Conservation Commission meetings and the Planning Board meetings, this is a rough piece of property. I think we're finding that out to some degree. Um, be that as it may, um, in the spirit of progress, um, I think some good conditions have been met or listened to or heard. I appreciate what this board is doing with uh, the questions and the continuation that's happened, but I am asking you to consider four or five concerns that I have um, that maybe you can uh, help address. The first one is the 75 foot buffer around my property. Um, I don't know. Maybe like you know, the tribal folks saying nothing may be okay at first, but I, I, I have to say that Looking to the left as I walk out my front door at those two rows of panels on the left-hand side, I'm not sure that any screening is going to be able to prevent me from seeing those or anybody else. Um, so I'm asking you to consider the 75 foot and maintain the at least portion of 75 feet around my property line. The second item is the telephone poles are going to be put on the property. We haven't talked a lot about those. My understanding from the bylaw is that everything needs to be underground. We're allowing, it appears, overhead um, across the Tennessee gas pipeline because evidently that's the only way that that can occur. Um, and uh, if we're going to allow that as part of this special permit, that maybe some of these other things like my 75 foot maybe the interconnection and getting the information that we can do comparisons on from Wilson Street and Cedar Street can be um, thoroughly vetted so that we can maybe get it over on the Cedar Street side. Um, this is a small thing, but I anywhere between just about every night, one to seven deer are on my property. If the picture could you know, show the whole you know, piece there, those large animals, um, deer and turkeys and so forth, 
will have to come all the way to the southern side or go over to the Tennessee gas pipeline to cross over. Maybe in the narrow part of that top array where there's only a road, uh, we could uh, ask for a gate where it's open so the large animals could cross over into the wetland areas. It, that's not the picture that I was looking for, but. Um, you mean right at the base? Oh. It gets very narrow. Yeah, where, the, where it goes out to Wilson Street. And not, there's not a so gap. Much. No, it's right nope. in the middle of the top array. Just so you know, I'm looking at it above your head, yeah. not ignoring. <laughs> so if we could zoom in on that, it's right where her, just move your mouse down a little bit. Right there. There is nothing there other than a road. There's no panels, no anything. So that would be an environmental thing. A wildlife thing. gate, yeah. Could there be a gate on each side of that entrance and the animals could in fact go across the road? And then lastly, if we can't get Cedar Street and we're gonna have to you know, live with the connection on Wilson Street and whatever else may or may not happen here, for the benefit of everybody, including the scenic road, I think those two rows of panels that are right near Wilson Street, it'd be great if those weren't there. I think a lot of issues would go away if that, that was pushed back, it would still provide the scenic road. You couldn't see it. Mrs. Hanowich wouldn't have the issue. Uh, Mr. Cutter, myself, wouldn't. Um, and so those are the four or five things that I would ask you all to consider, which I have concerns with. So Tom, can I ask you this question? Um, your point was if those two rows that are right along the existing cart path, which will be the road which impose on your property the buffer, um, if those went, you would, be, um, you would be more accepting of the buffer limits? Yes. Thank you. Um, can I just uh, clarify that I do think that even though that small portion of my property is residential A in the back, that I believe the 75 foot would It is absolutely the law in Hopkinton that it, the 75 foot is the, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yep. My name is Edward Cutter. Hi, Edward. Hi, how are you today? Good, how are you? I live at 21 Wilson Street. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll try to wing it. Uh, with respect to the buffer, uh, the requirement of the 75 feet is in a generic provision, specifically in the solar provision. I think it would be read as being in the solar provision, so I'm not quite. So just to clarify, my understanding of Hopkinton zoning law, the agricultural district is a residential district, yes, so it agree. applies. Agreed with so you. we all but agree. My point is that I see the granting of a special permit is sort of a waiver of the basic rule that you can't put a solar farm any place you want. You, it's, a, it, it's, not a, it's not something that you own, it's not a right, it's some permission that might be given to you. So you're being some, given some permission in the first place to perhaps be able to put a solar farm in on a residential area and then letting there be a waiver of some requirement that deals with buffers generally is to me in a way a double dip. If anybody so I'm, I'm not understand. sure that we would agree with that, but. Uh, uh, I urge that the board uh, does not grant a special permit as I think the solar farm would cause significant detriment to the neighborhood. <coughs> and solar panels, I believe, among residences should not be permitted. They're offensive, especially with an interconnection on the residential street as is proposed. Now, Wilson Street is certainly not a perfect. I'm sorry, can I, hold on. I'm gonna ask, entertain a motion to open the 845 um, continued public hearing on Whisper Way and uh, continue it till the conclusion of this conversation. Second. And I'll oh. try to go quicker. All those in favor? Hi. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry, that was my my gap. Okay, where was it? Wilson uh, yeah. Street is certainly not a perfect street. In fact, it's sort of quirky. There's an ancient cemetery. Next to that, there's a wood mill. Up the street, there are fuel tanks. I think we're within the three second or five second. And you don't want to drive in that street in a snowstorm. 
My wife and I purchased on Wilson Street in 2000 because it wasn't all planned out, neat and orderly, but rather it has sort of a country back roads rustic feel. Others live there for the same reason. This community feeling is held together. Indeed, it's strengthened as new neighbors and new homes have joined the community, and neighbors enjoy this quality and this type of living. Dropping 6,600, I think that's the number, if you permit, ugly panels, they can't be anything other than ugly, that's their nature, into our area could destroy the quality of life and environment which we have enjoyed. External threats from legacy, both north and south, and whatever source is doing next week, and I expect they'll continue to be doing things because they have to. They've been held off by distant, friendly wetlands, rocky terrain, a cemetery, and even a gas line around the perimeter of our properties. But insertion of an industrial complex in our midst may not be surmountable. I feel there'll be loss in market value, inflow of new neighbors, as the people who desire the type of environment that we've enjoyed will be turned off. I feel we'll be the street known as the street with the tanks and a solar system. It could cause dismay in how we feel about where we live every day. My suggestion is for rejection of a special permit in its entirety, but if the board thinks that it must grant some approval, I suggest, as Tom did a short while ago, that there be removed <coughs> from the project the panels between Tom's house and my house. The applicant previously added 200 panels to the southwest, I think it's a southwest array, about 200 of them, um, and the panels I suggest be removed are those that are closest to the street, and I fear that no matter, even with the best of buffering, uh, they still will be <coughs> readily visible, especially from those across the street. They will clearly be visible from Tom's yard, from his deck, from his second floor window at least. Uh, the applicant has benefited, it appears tonight, and I think it's still a little bit confused, but it appears we're gonna end up with the interconnection on Wilson Street, which the neighbors and I think some members of this board have serious questions whether that's where it should be but it appears that might be where it has to be. Doing that is benefiting the applicant. They're saving some money that they might have had to spend to do something on Cedar Street. Uh, they're saving time. Uh, if these two rows of panels are removed, uh, there will be savings to them. This isn't the reason I'm suggesting it, but there'll be savings to them in terms of fencing, uh, plantings, and perhaps other things as well. The opening paragraph of the solar bylaw sets forth the need to, and I'll quote, minimize impacts on residential neighborhoods. And I think that this modest reduction is a reasonable, equitable manner in which to do that. An email from Stan Allen who appeared here at one meeting and talked about the Howe Street, if people know that one. It's at the end of Wilson Street, effectively. The Howe, the Howe Street uh, solar situation was pretty distasteful if you lived in that area and asked that it not be, uh, that we don't follow that. He, he lives in the house opposite the wood mill. He sent a note to the board this morning, and I don't know him this well. I was touched that he came out with this note. But what he said, and I ask that you consider, and quoting Steve, I guess I can, because he made it public, the decisions made will last 50 years. Once the project is built, it'll be there for the rest of our lives. Please do not degrade a beautiful stretch of Wilson Street. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Without the glasses. Nice job without the glasses. I'm impressed. Is there anybody else um, that would like to come forward at this time? 
Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Chad Klasna, 10 Wilson Street. Uh, just the, the one point I want to make that's been, um, everyone's brought up is the continuing debate about the interconnection between Wilson and uh, versus Cedar Street. Um, what I just wanted to question or raise um, from what I've heard, the applicant has characterized it as saying tonight that there are fatal flaw reasons for why the um, interconnection cannot be done on Cedar, but from what I've heard, that's the applicant's characterization. I've not actually heard the evidence to support that. What it sounds like is there, there's... There's evidence in the packet. And I had reviewed the online Google documents yeah. th today, but I hadn't seen that. So there is evidence, I guess even just to clarify, it really is impossible to do it from the Cedar side? I I'm not sure that it is really impossible, but there is uh, documentation included in the packet to that subject, and it was before today. And that was what Gary was referring to with the LGG. I think consulting firm yes. hired by. Okay. I guess what I would just ask the board to do is that uh, to the extent of whatever evidence has been submitted on that issue um, is that while there may be additional hardships to the applicant to do it on Cedar Street, it still sounds like if it, if it is within the realm of feasibility, um, even if there's some additional cost, obviously the applicant is, uh, you know, tonight acknowledged they're going to be producing, you know, the additional expense of uh, custom racking systems for the panels now due to the, um, the preservation of the, the uh, ceremonial stones. So even if there's some additional cost or some hardships with doing the interconnection on Cedar Street, I think the added benefit of doing it there to completely avoid and minimize disruption of the scenic road and the residential houses, I think that would be um, worth considering. So, thank you. Yep, thank you. Anybody else from the public? Okay, so I think that I'm going to ask the... Oh, oh yes. This is uh, the annual report, the 2017 annual report from the uh, National Park Service, and there's a little tab there that addresses ceremonial stone landscapes. Just wanted that to enter into your record. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I want to put it out to the board. I know that we have um, a somewhat abbreviated conversation to have um, with um, <coughs> Whisper Way. Would you like to entertain that now and then come back to this conversation with the time we should have left? I think that would be a good idea. Yes, I agree with okay. All right. So I will entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to after the conclusion of the Whisper Way conversation. So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So is Whisper Way here? They must be out now. Okay. All right. So, Chris, we're going to pick it up again because yeah. we don't have a full. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. So I understand that we have a lot of comments back and forth, engineering comments with Beta, um, and so that we have a we have a sort of a smaller conversation that you wanted to complete tonight. Is that what the plan was? Correct. Okay. Take uh, us away. My name is Dan Hazen. I'm with Gary and Halnon. Uh, we just received back conservation commission comments, and one of their requests is that. In the area of the wetland crossings that the grass strip between the road and the sidewalk be eliminated so that the sidewalk would be right against the back of the uh, the berm in those areas 
to narrow up the wetland crossings to minimize impacts to the vernal pool and also to the, uh, the amount of wetland fill that would be required. Now to do that we'd need a waiver from planning board so to try to coordinate so we're not going back and forth between conservation and planning board we're asking if the board would be amenable to that um, that waiver in that area on site on site correct does anybody have any questions comments our sidewalk guy yeah i would prefer the, the green belt in between but if this conservation committee feels that we should not have it i would go along with that and just clear, this is only in the area of the crossing. Every place else, the green belt is still correct. Is it just one crossing, or uh, there's crossing. three crossings? There's um, <coughs> another one down by. There's the existing whisper yep. coming in off of, uh, and then um, halfway up, there's a uh, crossing right here, a smaller one, and then there's the one down over near 495. So there'd be three areas that it would just be within the area of the retaining wall on this up the one side. So the chair is there rough estimate of distance, like 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet? Uh, probably about 150 <coughs> feet overall. Sorry, 150 feet. overall. Feet. So, correct. Uh, and then we'd be able to transition from, basically what we would do is at the catch basin headstones, the, the granite, we would transition at that point into the uh, where the sidewalk would transition in, would run through to the next catch basin, and then we would transition back out. Anybody have any questions or comments? Makes sense. I mean, I'm just trying to visually kind of figure mm -hmm. out what. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I just uh, want to make sure that we hold on to the fact that this is an additional waiver uh, and there is, you know, there's a, a list of them. So I just want to be cognizant of the fact I'm, I'm actually okay with this and I appreciate from a process standpoint, it helps you as you're working through the CONCOM process. All right. So if anybody would like to make the motion to allow that waiver at this time. So moved. Second. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any more comments or questions? I just have one more question. The, the transition from the, the portion of the greenway to the wetland crossing, will that be a smooth transition for the sidewalk or will it be a... It would be gradual. It, it, it won't be a, uh, an abrupt turn in. It'll, we'll be able to transition in smoothly so that it, aesthetically it won't it'll be, be a, it, it'll flow. It won't be a sharp angle. I, I apologize, Phil. I should have asked you for comments before we move forward. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty standard. Um, so it's uh, to protect the wetlands. Um, the only pedestrians on the sidewalk, we would ask that uh, the Cape Cod berm on that side of the road, that it go to a vertical ramp. So. I know that's something that conservation was looking to avoid. Um, just because the, the, and I understand where Phil's coming from and trying to, trying to blend the two of them together is going to be a challenge because the vertical granite creates in conservation's eyes, a uh, impediment to any creature trying to get across the road. Um, but again, it's a matter of public safety also. So creatures, people. <laughs> okay. Anybody? Uh, yep. I would, I would just say that I understand, you know, granite. What would what would be the advantages of the, the granite? So it's better protection for to keep ro um, cars off the vehicles road. off the sidewalk. How high are we talking? Sorry, through the chair. How high of a vertical? Typical six inches. I don't see that as a major wildlife inhibitor. I don't necessarily see it as a huge safety feature either. But <laughs> I'm just thinking of it as, as the builder mentioned, from an aesthetic point of view. Right. You're going to have, you know, asphalt curbing and all, Cape Cod brim, and all of a sudden there's going to be a vertical granite. granite. I can 
could really go either way on I, that. I mean, the cars will be going fairly slow. I would think it's a curvy road, right? I mean, this town at one time supported the low impact development, which has no curbs. So I would be okay I, with. I need you to heal from that. No, 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 I'm just saying, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying that in relation, no curb <clears throat> to caping side cars off the sidewalk that of a Cape Cod Berman, in my opinion, is fine. Um, from from my perspective, in a in a small development, um, hopefully, you know, it's all the same neighbors and neighbors' kids, and they're driving with a little. Car. I, I I can um, support the you know consistent the sidewalk throughout. That's me. Yeah, I don't have any issues. Sounds like we're all in agreement to support what the, the applicant is asking for, right? So that was the motion, and that was the second. Are we all in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So right. that works. Right. Um, so we have so what was that final? That it's going to be, it, we, we voted against you, Phil. I'm sorry to say we're not going to put the, for the stretch. All right, we're going to lose another half a foot. So. I'm sorry, say it again. Okay, no matter. No, yeah. I don't understand. You're, uh, definitely come forward if you need, a, need to make a point. No, no, okay. Okay. So just to build on what Muriel said, we, we appreciate the input and we considered it, but we decided to go with the original plan. So, uh, so there's one other item regarding sidewalks. Is uh, when we're on the sidewalk, I'm sure you remember we were out there pacing around and deciding, trying to taking trying our to, life trying into to our hands on Wood Street. Said, <laughs> this isn't for, for now, but we, we need to discuss this at the meeting. So yes. Um, so um, you know, uh, I guess originally I was thinking that we'd be building a sidewalk on top of what's the existing road. And, um, and I was assuming that we'd have room for a foot or two of, uh, of paving behind the fog line before you got to the berm for the sidewalk. So it, it looks like it's a little tight for a five foot sidewalk. Um, guardrail may have to be moved. I think a guardrail had to be moved. Um, it's gonna be wetlands impacts and so on and so forth. So, uh, I'm not sure where we go with the sidewalk. Um, I think one, or I think some some members suggested that maybe a sidewalk isn't even necessary there. Um, I don't know. So just to be I clear, we're talking I about between the two entrances, correct? Along Wood, Wood Street. Street. Yes. Yes. So I think there's about a five foot. I think it was five, the I think the the least it was five feet between the back of the uh, fog line and the face of the guy. And uh, at me as a, as a cyclist, that works really well for me. But, um, you know, you feel safer, you're not up on the sidewalk. And, um, but so to put a berm there and to, and to put a, and to elevate it, I'm not sure if, uh, throw it up there. Concom is probably going <coughs> to Gonna jump up and down. I'm gonna well. resist that we idea. Have to go further into the. I'm not sure I'm following. So along uh, Wood Street, there's a section where there's a guardrail, so there isn't as much space to put in a sidewalk. We had asked about a sidewalk along Wood Street uh -huh. between the two entrances, and that guardrail would have to be moved deeper into the wetland to in order to put a sidewalk in. So Am I saying that? I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, you're not the only one with this challenge. The, um, the sidewalk <coughs> for Legacy Farms, from Legacy Farms to the center of town, they had planned on the same thing and putting it inside the roadside of the, the guardrail, and I think they, they backed off that. So I just want to point out that I don't know if there is a good solution mm -hmm. for that. So, what are you proposing? That we eliminate the. Well, uh, Looking for input from the board, I, yeah. I guess I would propose to uh, leave it as is. But um, I don't, I don't know. It's not, it's not really a friendly area to be walking to begin with, whether there's a sidewalk or not. Um, it's, you know, it's it's on a corner. It's probably a 40 mile an hour posted road, but it's probably a little bit quicker than that. It's heavy trucks. It's not. A, it's not. It's not an area where I'd want 
children walking. You know, so I have a proposal and before I, just before you jump in, Fred. What about further inland, 10, 20 feet, some kind of sidewalk that runs along the edge of somebody's property, just connecting the two roads? Because that's really all we're trying to do is for the neighborhood is connect yeah. the two with that. Yeah, there's no, there's, there's no, there's it's, no. we're right up, right up against the wetlands now. Right. On, on both sides, like on the residential side as well? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in this, in this one area where, where there's a crossing with a pipe, a, a pipe that goes under the road, under Wood Street, and the head wall is real close to behind, it's just behind the guy. Room. And then the other side, we didn't go the other side. I don't think we're going to solve it tonight. Yeah, I no, do think no. I do think that yeah, um, yeah. yeah, it's worth asking Concom what it how it impacts yeah. your project, um, and bringing that back to us for sure. Okay. And we're also get with the Mass DOT to see what they what the yep. report is. Yep. Ultimately, yep. that is Mass DOT's road. Even you know it's a town Definitely road. Definitely get their thoughts. They, right. So I need yep. to. Sorry, I need to coordinate what this board wants also with what they yeah oh so I, in a perfect world we want the sidewalk because we we asked about it but mm -hmm. we're definitely willing to entertain we're uh, not unreasonable right so, the chair, if I yeah. could just my one ask would be that to make sure to maintain at least two preferably three feet between the fog lane and any sort of barrier um, uh, I would argue that there's more bicycles to take that route than there are than there would be pedestrians Right. Yeah, I mean, only to kind of there, kind of piggyback on that. The only people that really are going to walk that are going to be people in the neighborhood to get a loop. Mm -hmm. Right. Sense of purposes, right? Because right. other than that, it's going to be bikers. <coughs> there's really no runners. For all things that are going to go out there. It's going to be people. Just in Justin say, not, just not saying, to be I, argumentative, I, but there there actually are quite a few runners that run Wood Street. Yeah. And I, I have I, I, I yeah. have walked myself um, when I've been training for different fundraising walks and so forth. I have absolutely walked that stretch. But I mean. There are people out there. I'm sensitive to bikes too, for sure. And I, and I would just sort of address that issue as well: is that that road is a pretty fast-moving road, and if we could, if we felt put a sidewalk in there to make it a little bit safer, um, that would, you know, we concur so with. with I think the, I think that we're not sense. going to solve it tonight. Yeah. I'd like to preserve the time that we have. Um, when are do we have open for them to come back? Yes. Hold on one second. And yes, you may. It's about scheduling. So. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, can I jump in? Yeah. So, we're not unreasonable, and we could pull this back at some point in the future, right? I mean, if it's unreasonable, but what I would suggest is let them build the development and let us get back out there and look and see what it looks like down the road. I mean, when you put the street in, right, on both sides, we might come across with some sort of idea at that point. Either go with it or don't go with it, but there might be something that kind of flushes out that we can visually see versus us trying to imagine things now. That's all I was going to suggest. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't particularly work for me. I think that we, we, um, we approve the project in its entirety or, you know, however we see it. But I mean, if you want at the time to suggest coming back to it, I'm fine to consider that. When's our next? Uh... Um, so the decision for this is due on the 23rd, so that would need be, to be extended as well. Yep, thank um, you. Meeting for the 15th is pretty full, and that's two weeks away. So October 29th, I would suggest. What time? Uh, we have Buckland and Leonard at 745. I guess I'm not clear what we're scheduling. Are we scheduling the f approval for this development? Or? No, we're the scheduling the continuation of the hearing because there's a lot of engineering that has to happen. Oh, there's other stuff. Not, oh, yeah, yeah. No, this the, is okay. not the only thing. Okay, no, sorry, no, sorry. no. Yep. Concom is um, not final yet. What's that? Concom is not listed. Concom is not final, right. Okay. Um, so I'm going to recommend that we um, schedule them for 750 so we don't waste our evening. Um, and then if Buckland and Leonard does come in, we'll, we'll juggle it at that point. So just so you know, we have another hearing that has continued to be continued. Um, so, <laughs> okay, I, got, I will entertain a motion to continue the Whisper Way subdivision public hearing and the decision date to... Oh, I need to pull my calendar. Yeah. You can continue the meeting. We can do that. No, one. no, the, um, the meeting is the... 29th. 29th. 29th, but the decision would be? Um, we could do November 6th. So November 6th for the decision, is that reasonable? Uh, 
Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to October 29th at 7.50 p.m. Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Appreciate it. So, Chris, we have 15 minutes before the next um, public hearing, so if we okay. want to come back. <coughs> Um, did you want to respond to any of the public comments that we received? I would like to respond to the issue over uh, Cedar Street versus Wilson Street. I just can tell you that the, um, the developer pays an extremely large application fee, which they did again to get this in return. I, I, I don't know if this entity is, I believe they're paid out of that fee and they act as um, uh, an independent consultant to the energy company. Uh, the red flag, the mention of the red flag in here is a, that, that terminology, my understanding is, means it will not be approved. The red flag is it will not be approved. The Wilson Street property, when they first, we normally never submit these, so it's, it's not unusual that you don't have the, whatever other study was done, but that was not red flagged, it was approved. That's why these plans were submitted. So I just wanted to clarify that. All right, thank you. Um, what might be an easy one, the wildlife gate at the uh, narrow point in the center. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that these plans have already received conservation approval, and I'm guessing that if there was any concern about wildlife migration through the site, that it would have been entertained in that forum. Um, I, again, I, this is, you know, kind of just coming up, but um, typically we try to limit the amount of. This is a secured facility, um, so with that being said, we're required to provide. Um, Knox boxes for emergency access at all times um, in addition to the maintenance activities having a series of secure access gates that are not only going to hinder maintenance operations but also potentially hinder a response from an emergency situation or typically that's why we typically will go with one access gate in this instance it's a little odd where we have the easement bisecting the array, and so that calls for a second access gate with a second Knox box. Um, so Is that easement op wide open? That's not fenced? Correct. Correct. Um, I do for my purposes, um, think that we need to, um, if, we're, if we're able to take action on this tonight, we do need to have a mechanism to circle back after the full survey is done and the plans are more final, to your, to your point. So some condition in there, this is a little unusual, I understand, but some condition in there. No, we're gonna put it in the conditions. And then it'll be, yeah, is that a, that's typical how we do it. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that we, we do have to talk about the in interconnection piece um, and um, the buffer piece explicitly. But I want to just walk through and make sure we have satisfied the agenda. If only I could find it again. I did have it. Mm -hmm. It's true. Oh, okay. there it is. Um, so access and entrances. I think that we just we need to make a decision. Um, screening. There was, um, you know, additional comment that perhaps the screening wouldn't be adequate. Can you just speak to how you have addressed the the um, issue of whether it's summer or winter? Sure. Sure. We've. Um We've gone through great lengths to what I thought was coordinate an amenable landscape alternative screening plan. Um, 
I, I feel that we have. I feel that the number of plantings, the placement of the plantings is certainly adequate. We've also added a note in there that after the initial screening is installed, the, the screening that was installed shall be reevaluated during non-foliar months to ensure that we're not just capturing a snapshot during the summer when the forest is at its most robust state. We're going to go back when uh, the, the deciduous leaves have fallen, the understory has thinned out, and take another look. And that will be done by a landscape professional. Um, and we would request that someone just to document compliance, uh, a, mem a designee of the board be there present as well to ascertain is the screening as it's proposed, as it was installed, adequate. If it's not, um, then additional, you know, the applicant is amenable to additional screening will be provided um, to the determination that it is not a visual impact. Um, and again, that's where I think the importance of having the designee of the board is absolutely um, paramount to documenting compliance because based on the revisions that I've done, some of the changes that I've incorporated even at the 11th hour, I have a feeling that no matter what we propose is not going to be satisfactory, so to speak. So I would um, suggest that the person would be a, one of the, a professional from town who would come out and, and do that work with you, not necessarily a board member. Sure, we would rely on whatever your preference would be, just someone who's a, a third party, if you will, who can take a look at it and, and figure out really what's going on and what, what needs to be done. Okay, is everybody okay with us checking off screening? Um, I believe the Upper Charles Trail Committee <coughs> is satisfied as well. We got a commitment from the property owner that if that that he would welcome them to come come back to him and negotiate if it turned out to be um, a positive or a necessary connecting piece. Is that right? Does it, is that everybody else's? Okay. So I'm going to check off Upper Charles Trail. Um, uh, I am really appreciative of the, um, the work that went into the historical structures. As far as I'm concerned, we can check off that piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we have what I would call the last two hard questions. Um, one is the buffer and the, the request to remove that, that uh, double array that's at the far, at far closest point to Wilson Street. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I, I can confidently say that this is one of the smaller projects that I'm currently working on within the applicant's portfolio. Um, I know that they're not all planning board issues, but with all due consideration being pulling out of the 100 foot at the request of the Conservation Commission, in addition to, to adding the screening and realizing potential losses in the Cedar Street subarray with our preservation efforts, we just can't simply afford to, to lose another panel, um, especially uh, an impact that great where we're you know, roughly around 300 panels in that area. Um, and where you know, all of these projects have a contractual requirement as far as the, the generating capacity um, and we need every last bit, especially not realizing what is going to happen on the Cedar Street subarray with our preservation efforts. Um, we need every last square foot of panel that we show on here. And, you know, again, with planting over 600 trees and shrubs and working directly with the homeowners and, and giving them essentially everything that they've asked for with exception of not pursuing the project, um, we feel that the alternative screening is adequate um, and um, will put the board in a position to render a favorable decision. Um, but I would not want to speak for the board. Can I clarify? Are, are any of those panels within 75 feet of the property line? Uh, along the frontage of by Wilson Street? Right. I think and or the property the and the neighbor's the property too is right as well. Well, I didn't know if it was just the road that was closer than 75 feet. Or right, if it was I the understood. Your, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understood the question. 
the panels are just about coming in off of Wilson Street to the right, those two rows, the closest panel is roughly 70 feet, I think, from the property line. Um, so if it was a matter of, I, you know, again, I can't, you know, what is the number? There's no magic number, but if the board was looking for 75 feet from the property line in that area to the panels, I could certainly do that. But the buffer in that area is really driven by the location of the existing car path. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 a number of different things makes the site challenging, but topography is one of the first and foremost, and that car path is already cut in, if you will. Comes down a slope with a pretty defined tree line. And so the existing vegetated buffer on that side is, is just, is, it's gone. In addition to the, the fact that we have 10,000 square feet of lawn area that is on our property, further taking away from that existing buffer, which may or may not have been there at one point in time. So along the western portion of the property, the panels are just about 30 feet, a little less than 30 feet from the property line. Um, but again there, the panels are set 10 to 15 feet below the grade of the homeowner and with the robust screening and different levels, the low store, the understory screening, and then coupled with the um, cultivar type, um, you know, the green giant arborvitaes that are, provide a, a fast growing and instantaneous robust um, screen, visual screen, the, the visual impact for the, the panels, at least in that area, um, the topography alone would say that it's not going to be a visual impact, but in addition to the alternative screening we're providing there, you know, our take is that, you know, those panels tucked up against the hillside, I mean, you're not seeing the panels that are closest to the property line. Um, but along Wilson Street, again, I think I could realize a very minimal um, impact and remove a very minimal amount of panels and at least ensure that the panels are panels themselves are 75 feet from Mr. Shambo's northerly property line. Um, to yeah. the chair. Um, I guess also there was some talk about the um, inside poles that were going to be exposed. How high are they? Where, where exactly are they on the plan and, and how high are they? And are those going to be buffered from his second story window? The overhead poles? Yeah. They're out in the middle of the gas easement. And we're required to go overhead um, twofold. One is due to crossing the gas easement, um, typically with an underground gas line. Um, they don't promote going underground and digging anywhere near, near a high pressure, high transmission yeah, underground yeah. gas line. Um, and so we have the wetland crossing, which crosses this, the easement in that location. And so to avoid direct impacts to the wetland, we have a series of poles and maximize that span to reduce the number of poles we require to get across. Do you mind pointing them out exactly to me and, and then sh telling me what heights they are? I just, I'm sorry, there are just so many dots. Sure, sure. They're, uh, so if you're looking at George's hand or mouse cursor, <laughs> uh, the, if you go to the equipment pad, the first pole is up in the northwest corner of that array, and we come up a little bit more. Keep going. It's up in that area, roughly, right there. And so that's the first pole. We cross the gas easement to another pole, cross the wetland to the north. So. Mr. Shambo's property is here. The first pole is down here. And so that's how many feet down from Mr. Shambo's house? Uh, a long, I, long way. I, I mean, vertical or horizontal distance? Um, vertical. Vertical is in excess of 20 feet below. And how, and how high are the poles? Uh, the poles are roughly, you know, I don't know exactly. <coughs> it's going to be a standard utility pole, so 20, 30 feet probably tops. I'm not sure exactly. Um, but the remaining forest in between some of those trees 
dwarf 20 or 30 feet. So as far as a visual impact from the poles themselves, they're in the middle of the, the site um, in an industrial area um, and in close proximity to the gas easement. Um, so we're not anticipating. Through, through the chair, just in relation to her question, can, can you just go through and mark the rest of the poles like you sure, started doing? Sure. So we come out of our equipment pad underground to our first pole where we cross the easement. Um, and we've crossed the easement here because this is where the clearing is offset, which will allow us to run the, our overhead outside of the easement and avoid any additional tree clearing because we're in close proximity to the wetland. So our second pole is here. Um, we cross the wetland to our third pole here. And again, we're very close to the wetland. So we have one, two more poles to get back across the easement to feed into the system, if you will. Um, this pole, this, this pole here is required. The gas easement likes you to cross at a perpendicular angle with just about anything you're crossing. And due to the fact we maximize this span to avoid and really spread our impacts as far away from the resources we could, we needed this other pole for this final run just to cross back at 90 degrees um, to get outside of the jurisdiction, if you will, and cross the easement itself. To that yep. point, uh, Chris, is it one line that's going over? So I'm thinking of envisioning when you say a pole, an aluminum pole that's approximately 30 feet that kind of tees at the top, like a better term. Are we talking a single line, or are there lines going, multiple lines going over? Uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I have to interrupt you, Chris. No, no, don't be sorry. Um, I'm going to entertain a motion to open our um, public hearing for 55 Wilson Street Stormwater Management Permit application for Eversource Energy uh, to be uh, to conti be continued <coughs> until the conclusion of this conversation. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. So just one more question along yes. those lines. Not sure how many wires there are, but so the, the only poles are along the easement, Chris? Yes. There, there's none that go back along the uh, car path road, right? That's correct. They're okay. all within, yeah. let's call it 10 feet within the edge of the it, easement. It, it sounds like we don't easement. have an option with that because of the gas line, they can't go underground. So it doesn't seem like that's even a possibility. So just for, to further try to understand this, the major source of power is coming off of Wilson Street. Correct. And, and it's coming in an overhead line. And no, it's underground. All now now, now it's we've underground. established that it's underground. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's coming down the road. It's coming down the cart path. Correct. Underground. Correct. All the way to the gas easement. All the way to the gas easement. And that's the only sole source of power. That's our, our yes, I would say our point of interconnection to the, to the grid was through that underground run all the way to Wilson Street. So it's not really a source of power, it's a destination of power. Yeah. So destination, oh, right, I'm sorry. To that point, Madam Chair, we're, we're switching a little bit here from the um, covering to the interconnectivity aspect. Mm -hmm. But what you're proposing on Wilson Street underground, you're, you're proposing the additional of one additional pole? No additional poles. No additional poles. So it's going to go underground, connect with the existing pole on the east side of Wilson Street. Correct. OK. Yeah, that was the change I outlined earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, and, and yeah. I get it. And, and so it's minimally invasive Correct. on Wilson Street as a result of Correct. being, being underground. Yeah. So there we are. Um, should we, do we, anybody have any more questions or comments on access and entrances? I just got an answer on the number of wires. It's three phase, so there will be three wires. Thank you. What's that on Wilson Street? What's that? I'm just curious as to what that adds on Wilson Street. Does that put three more lines on Wilson Street no, also? No, Wilson or? Street is an existing three phase, and so that's. You'll just cut into the existing wires that are there. Correct. There'll yeah. be no more wires. Correct. Okay. 
So I have a question. As far as adding more panels, if we, <coughs> if we were to kind of talk about removing those two rows in the front, closest to Wilson Street, I see a lot of gaps in, in the plan. Are there reasons for those gaps? What, what are the gaps doing? I'm sorry, wow. Well, so, for example, um, on the, is that north? The northwest side. Yeah, I honestly think that it's way outside what, yeah. what we're going to do here to add panels, you know, I'm to just change saying, the I'm plan. I'm just wondering if, if that's, looking at that would be possible, shifting some of them and, you know, it, it, is it, would it so affect the major these, functioning of it? Right. Right, we're taking that two rows of uh, panels and locating them yeah, somewhere okay. else. Yeah, where those panels are, we actually had three rows there, and we were forced to remove one because of the hundred foot buffer, and so we don't have any flexibility to slide those two rows. Really, and there's no upland left that's outside of the hundred foot buffer that isn't that does not have the presence of potential for preservation. Effort. Um, so I think that we have at least discussed all those. Um, CONCOM is settled. Um, are there any, um, the stormwater plan is settled with minor engineering changes? I'm looking behind you to, to fill. The stormwater plan with minor no, engineering? Do we need a specific condition, Phil, for that, or? Calcs could be provided prior to construction for review by beta. Okay. So um, would you reread your conditions that you're going to add, we're going to add, because I don't have them in front of me? The following condition of approval, uh, one on behalf of the applicant, the tribe, uh, which I've delineated before, uh, will complete the survey to identify the features and any associated alignments within the area of potential effect of any cultural or historic or and his or historic resources and to determine what impact avoidance plan will be necessary. Two, in areas identified as requiring protection, the engineering of the racking system and associated infrastructure will be designed to protect and preserve the integrity of the identified cultural or historic resources. Three, a final engineering plan shall be provided to the planning board and the tribes at least seven days prior to filing for a building permit. Four, tribes or their designated representatives <coughs> will be present as construction monitors during tree, tree clearing to be allowed by hand and installation of racking systems and associated infrastructure for compliance and to identify any petroglyphs, remains, or new cultural or historic resources uncovered by the clearing to be preserved or protected. Okay, so the special permit criteria for the purposes of the board and the public, um, include that the commercial solar photovoltaic installation conforms to the provisions of the article. The commercial solar photovoltaic, I can't even say that word, installation shall not be detrimental to the neighborhood or the town. The environmental features of the site and surrounding areas are protected and specifically surrounding areas will be protected from the proposed use by provision, provision of adequate surface water drainage. The board must determine that the grant of the special permit will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning bylaw. The planning board may approve the special permit with conditions which may include the requirement of a performance bond and the requirement for additional screening of the facility. So here's the decisions and conditions including the ones that were just read to us. Um, so assuming we vote October 1, we will fill that in. 
Um, the vegetative planning is shown on the landscape submitted landscape plan dated August 20th, revised through September 25th, shall be completed concurrently with the installation of the solar facility, with the exception that if the facility is constructed in the winter months, planting may be deferred to the beginning of the next growing season. And I think it makes sense to add in there that um, um, representative of the town will. Oh, I have uh, that in the next one. What's, oh, you have it in the next one? Yeah, there there, I have uh, some suggested ones. Sorry, thank you. Prior to the start of the planting installation, the wetland scientist or landscape architect shall meet with the homeowner of 21 Wilson Street and the principal planner to coordinate the installation of plantings that are proposed on the property of 21 Wilson Street, as shown on the provided landscape plan. Um, additional conditions for the board to consider based on discussion prior to planting, the specific placement of screening planting shall be determined by a qualified wetland scientist or landscape architect to maximize screening effectiveness and ensure successful establishment of plantings. Following planting, the effectiveness of the installed screening shall be reevaluated during the non-foliar season by a qualified wetland scientist or landscape architect. Areas where additional screening is required shall be identified and screening shall be installed in said identified areas. Uh, a report detailing the evaluation shall be submitted to the board for review and approval. Prior to the start of construction, the ap applicant shall flag all ceremonial stone landscapes as shown. Is this additional so to these, what? Um, these are these what? I had put in before. Yep. He had recommended those great ones. So. Okay, so I'll cross that one out because we have other ones. I think there's three of them I put there. Okay. The next three, right? Yep. yep. Okay. The solar facility shall be constructed in conformance with the approved plan, the stormwater management permit, and the order of conditions issued by the Conservation Commission, said order to be enforced by the Hopkinton Conservation Commission. The Director of Municipal Inspections will inspect the solar facility's construction and operations for compliance with the special permit. Prior to commencement of construction, the applicant shall submit a detailed performance bond. Do we have a set performance bond? Uh, so that's set after um, approval. That's usually the process. Okay. Uh, the owner of the property and the, and the owner operator of the solar facility shall have a uh, decommissioning agreement in place for as long as the solar facility is located on the property. In accordance with provisions of 210203.e, uh, the applicant shall post a performance bond with the town in the amount equal to the <coughs> estimated cost to remove all components of the solar facility from the property. Um, all signage at the solar facility must comply with zoning. The operator of the solar facility shall conduct vegetation control on site. No pesticides, herbicides, or other chemical products shall be used. And it sets the hours of um, uh, uh, vegetation control by mechanical means, mowing. <laughs> um, it sets the hours for any, any, any of that. Um, the solar facility shall be subject to all setback, yard, buffer, and screening requirements applicable in the agricultural A and residential A RA districts. So we understand um, that there is a waiver requested. If the board grants the requested findings, a separate motion granting such findings should be made. They're just calling out those specific areas, stating that they're not um, subject to all set and yard. So that we're, that we're, so if we approve this, we're granting a waiver to that 75 foot setback. For the two areas, the Wilson the Street and Tom Chambos property. All security fences surrounding the insta installation shall be set pack, back from the property line at a distance equal to the setback requirements applicable to the buildings within the agricultural A and residential A districts pursuant to that section of the zoning bylaw. Um, no lighting shall be permitted on the, at the solar facility site except as required by Massachusetts State Building Code. Um, as required by zoning bylaws, the owner or operator of the facility shall maintain the facility in good condition. Maintenance is to include painting, structural repairs, etc. The director of municipal inspections determines if the director of municipal inspections determines um, uh, pursuant to the applicable sections of the zoning bylaws that the commercial solar installation has been discontinued, the owner shall remove the installation, including all structures, equipment, security barriers, tr and trans, etc. 
The solar facility shall be maintained in compliance with all the noise level requirements under the bylaws and zoning bylaws of the town. Prior to any construction or preparation for construction, the applicant owner will provide a surety in the amount of $10,000 to secure fu future maintenance, etc. Prior to any construction or preparation for construction, the applicant owner will provide a surety in the amount of $10,000 to secure future maintenance of the stormwater management system for up to five years. And catalog cut sheets of all equipment to be installed shall be pro provided to the principal planner for review prior to the pre-construction meeting. Um, So the um, <coughs> impact avoidance plan and then the protection plan is, is included in your conditions. Um, and a complete, so uh, a review after leaves have fallen is included in the conditions. Um, uh, I would like to consider adding a condition that the final plans for the protection of the uh, historic and cultural sites of significance are um, uh, provided to the historic commission. I would agree. Is that amenable? Yeah, again, just speaking to what Attorney Pacella said, as long as we could do it in a manner that limits public, public record for that plan. Right, so that's why I picked the Historic sure. Commission for Sure, Okay. Um, and then um, I think that the only thing that I didn't specifically say was that how we circle back after on any changes to the plan and to make sure the engineering is all set. What's the best way to do that? Um, so I'd put our note in there. Are you talking about for the most recent revisions? Yeah. Or once everything is said and done, there's some uh, some engineering that has to happen, right? Potentially. E, uh, potentially, I think it may just be a miscalculation in some areas, and I can work with Phil. Um, are you talking about? I'm sorry. You're talking about the preservation special permit versus the stormwater management. Plan. Okay. Oh, okay. about the engineering plan that's that's prepared at, as part of the conditions that I outlined yes. yes so that's included and there's a way to circle back to the planning board or to the engineer so that I believe ultimately if the if the if when it's provided seven days prior to construction or prior to uh, seeking the building permit either the planning board would would say that if there's a substantial change and they need another hearing and notice of us of that or the building inspector would would instead of granting the permit would say you need to go back to the planning board. That's procedurally where that would come in. If it needs to be written in, it, it doesn't change the normal process anyways. Is everybody okay with that? All right. So I will entertain a motion um, to <coughs> I'll just say in the affirmative to appro approve the solar special permit with those conditions as we just discussed. So moved. Is there a second? Does this mean we're granting the waivers? The so I'm entertaining a motion. Yes, it would mean that we are granting the waivers if we approve it. Yes, that's true. No, we're not voting yet, right? So there's a motion, yes. and in order to discuss it, we would have to have a second, or it's not a... It, I'll, I'll second to discuss. Okay. Discussion. Yes. Madam Chairman, uh, just for clarification, there's two specific waivers being requested. Uh, the setback on Wilson Street and mm -hmm. the setback for Mr. Chambeau's property. Correct. correct? Yes. I think there's also one for the underground utilities. <coughs> correct. So the wetland crop, we, the board would need to call that certain portion out that they are acceptable to the above ground utilities in the wetland portion we talked about those waivers, which you guys have discussed so the one piece on the wilson street did i hear you say correctly chris that you're at 70 feet now that you can do you can make some modifications to those two rows to adhere to the 75 foot buffer did i misunderstand i think that was just for the panels the the panels i could 
uh, the Mr. Shambo's northerly property line, um, we could, you know, again, not being in cab, but it appears just scaling off that I could probably get rid of pretty minimal amount of panels and make sure that the panels are outside of the 75 feet, but it's the existing vegetative buffer that, yeah, that I can't make that up. And, and the road itself would still be inside the 75 feet. Right, and that's just a dirt road that they would use for access purposes. Any other discussion? I guess sure, there's some. Yeah. Give us a little yep. I guess I would like to see um, shown on the map exactly where the waiver is being requested, like where it comes closer, the, it's closer than 75 sure. feet. It's a long, so this is Mr. Shambo's lot here. And so it's along this northerly property line. Can Currently, sure. Currently the, his property line is here. The existing tree line is all the way back here with the cart path coming in here. So, you know, really between the cart path and the existing tree line, you know, there might be 20 feet at best. Um, so that's one portion here. And then the second portion would be along this back edge here where it drops off down the hill. Um, we have you know, from the property line, roughly 42 feet. Um, but when you include the alternative screening here, the actual tree line in this area is, you know, roughly 75 feet wide. These two stretches here. Isn't there, through the chair, isn't there additional on the southwest as well? Here? No, south, all the way down southwest. Yeah, here? Isn't that an exception to the buffer as well? No, this is, um, I think just 10 feet. I actually was taking a look at that when I was redoing the, um, the fence line for the preservation plan, and I wanted to know how close I could get to that property line, and it's a residential, so it's 10 feet. My misunderstanding. Uh, no problem. There's three districts with the little... And then you'd also um, showed, shown um, to the front end of those two, two um, controversial arrays, um, 70 feet versus 75 from the road from Wilson Street. But you said you could get 75 feet out of that. Uh, no, that's, we have 70, there, we're maintaining at least 75 feet of existing forest in that area. It is, it is 75, okay. Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Roughly 80 feet. Mm -hmm. More discussion. More discussion. So I just wanted to make a comment that for the Lumber Street property, I did vote against it because I thought it would be detrimental to the neighborhood in the town. Just teeing up your vote? Not to, I'm, not, I'm not trying to <laughs> tell people which way I'm going to vote, but I'm yeah. going to tell them what I voted before. Okay. Um, Okay, we do have to move on because we have a, another public hearing that we have pushed off way too late. So, um, all those in favor signify by. I'm sorry. Yes? Can you just clarify what we're voting on now? We are voting an approval of this special permit um, with the conditions that we outlined. Thank you. Right, so a yes vote is to approve, a no vote is not to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. And I'm abstaining. Should we, um, I think it might be respectful to the applicant if we state our reasons why we voted against it. We also still need to vote on the storm one, I too. We do. I don't want to forget that. Um, I don't want you to forget it either. Um, and uh, I think that we can, but we have to move forward, okay. right? Um, the stormwater management permit, these are the draft conditions here. I don't, uh, oh, we added calculations um, to be provided um, prior and approved with beta prior to construction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, the conditions are all erosion and sediment controls shall comply with the following performance criteria. 
minimum total area of disturbance in protected <coughs> natural features and soil, sequence activities to minimize simultaneous areas of disturbance, mass clearings, and grading of the entire site shall be avoided, minimize peak rate of runoff in accordance with the Massachusetts stormwater standard, minimize soil erosion and control sedimentation during construction, divert uncontaminated water around disturbed areas, maximize groundwater recharge, install and maintain all erosion and sediment control measures in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications and good engineering practices, prevent off-site transport of sediment, protect and manage on and off-site material storage areas, overburden and stockpiles of dirt, burrow areas, and other areas used solely by the permitted project are considered a part of the project, comply with applicable, applicable federal, state, and local laws and regulations including waste disposal, sanitary sewer or septic system regulations, and air quality requirements including dust control, prevent significant alteration of habitats mapped by the Massachusetts Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program as endangered, threatened, or of special concern, estimated habitats of rare wildlife and certified vernal pools and priority habitats of rare species from the proposed activities, Institute interim and permanent stabilization measures which shall be instituted on a disturbed area as soon as practicable, practicable but no more than 14 days after construction activity has temporarily or permanently ceased on that portion of the site. <clears throat> Properly manage on-site construction and waste materials, prevent off-site vehicle tracking of sediments, dust control, um, diverting off-site runoff from highly erodible soils and steep slopes to stable areas. The project shall comply with the following erosion and sediment control requirements. Um, prior to any land disturbance activities commencing on the site, the developer shall physically mark limits of no land disturbance on the site with tape, signs, or orange construction fence so that workers can see the areas to be protected. Um, appropriate erosion and sediment control measures shall be installed prior to soil disturbance. Sediment shall be removed once the volume reaches a certain established height of the hay bale. <coughs> sediment from sediment traps or sedimentation ponds shall be removed when design capacity has been reduced by 50%. Soil stockpiles must be stabilized or covered at the end of each workday. Stockpile side slopes shall not be greater than two to one. Uh, disturbed areas shall remain idle for more than 14 days, shall be stabilized with seeding, wood chips, etc. For active construction areas such as borrow or stockpile areas, roadway improvements, and areas within 50 feet of the building under construction, a perimeter sediment control system shall be installed and maintained to control to contain soil. Tracking pad or other approved stabilization methods shall be constructed at all entrance exit points. Um, the permanent seeding shall be undertaken in the spring from March through May and in late summer and early fall from August to October 15th. Um, during the peak summer months and in the fall after October 15th when seeding is found to be impractical, practical, appropriate temporary stabilization shall be applied. All slopes steeper than uh, as defined as well as perimeter dikes, sediment basins, or traps and embankments must upon completion be immediately stabilized with sod, seed, and anchored straw, mulch, or other approved stabilization measures. Temporary sediment trapping devices must not be removed until permanent stabilization is established in all contributory drainage areas. All temporary erosion and sediment control measures shall be removed after final site stabilization. <coughs> Disturbed soil areas resulting from the removal of temporary measures shall be permanently stabilized within 30 days of removal. A minimum of seven days prior to the start of construction, a detailed construction sequence shall be submitted by, to the principal planner. Uh, a copy of the stormwater pollution prevention plan shall be provided to the board prior to building permit. All required SWPPP stormwater construction site inspe inspection report shall be submitted to the principal planner within 14 days of each inspection. An adequate stockpile of erosion control measures shall be on site at all times for emergency or routine replacement and shall include materials to repair or replace silt fence, hay bales, stone filters, berms, or any other devices planned for use during construction. The disturbance area shall be temporarily stabilized by hydro seeding if construction, construction of the commercial solar facility is not commenced within 30 days of lot clearing. Soil testing and excavation of the site's stormwater basins must be preserved by the board's engineer prior to laying loam and seed. All stormwater basins must be cleaned once the site is stabilized. So I will entertain a motion um, 
uh, on the stormwater management permit. So moved. It to approve with these conditions? With conditions. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? I'm abstaining. One, two. You, you, you can't vote, actually. Right, okay. but I just right. want to make sure you okay. knew I wasn't voting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Kobe, do you have the votes? Well, everyone said aye. <laughs> Who said aye? Two. For the storm water. For the storm water. Oh, and Deb? I voted aye. Oh, okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Okay. I'm still, I'm a little confused. So it can't go, can it go forward without the buffer reduction or? No. They would. So the special permit was not granted. Oh, right. All right, the storm water plan was, right? It's a simple majority. Yep. Um, so what happens then, Georgia, is if my understanding is correct, um, the applicant is free to try and address all the issues that may have impeded the approval mm -hmm. and come back. So would it be good for us to give our reasons? It would. Okay. But um, can we do it in quick time? Because we're going to be late now, and I don't want any complaints from anybody. <laughs> um, so, Deb, do you, wanna, do you have details on, quick details on why you um, voted no? I think mine was for the health and the welfare of the neighborhood. Um, I think they have some legitimate concerns that um, I don't think would be changed um, during the winter months, no matter how hard they try. Um, I also had um, the special waivers were what again? Let me see. Um, <coughs> anyway. Okay. If, if, if there's anything that's useful for the applicant. Um, and I, I feel strongly about supporting solar, and um, and I was, you know, it was hard for me to not um, in this case. But I do feel that the um, the impact to the Wilson Street and Scenic Road, as well as impact to the abutters, um, that it wasn't appropriate to waive the buffer zones. So. Um, special waivers, I think special waivers as, I mean, to, to overcome those, there needs to, be, there needs to be some other benefit in some capacity or something for the town, and, and I just don't see that. Uh, secondly, I, I still believe that the, um, the, the interconnection belongs in a um, commercial zone off of Cedar Street. So, for the same reasons I voted down Cedar <coughs> Street, I voted it for the detrimental to the town and the neighbors. Um, I do also support solar. I have 30 panels on my roof in my home. Um, but just the um, clear cutting of forest to put in panels, uh, I don't approve of that. I think it's bad for the neighborhood, bad for the town. So my main concern was the 75 foot butter. I didn't think it was fair to the, uh, the abutter to be that close to their property. If it was not necessary. I, I was fairly satisfied with the other things they'd done to mitigate the screening and the um, Ceremon protecting the ceremonial stone structures. So the buffer was my sticking point. Can I ask a clarifying question? If, um, if the applicant were to remove those two rows, they would still impose on the buffer, but the two rows would not be there? Does that make a difference for you? Yeah, I think that, that would. OK, I just for purposes of the applicant. It doesn't for me. Huh? It does not for me. OK. I think this is good, to be fair, because obviously they put a lot of work No, in absolutely. This, so we, we, absolutely. We don't take that lightly. I am. Um, I want to reiterate. I, I could have voted either way. I abstained for uh, a different reason. Um, I just wanted to preserve um, uh, an, an, an abstention it, when you come back. I didn't want to take a no or a yes position. I could have voted either way. Truly, um, I'm really appreciative of the work that has gone into this to mitigate the difficulties of the site, and I am extremely appreciative of the work that has gone into it and was pledged to go into it to protect uh, the sites of cultural and historic significance. Um, personally, I thought that was uh, um, an, an amazing effort and I really appreciate that that happened. Okay, okay thank you. All right. Actually, you know what? I'm going to ask you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Close the hearings. 
Oh, I will entertain a motion to close the, the public hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, we do have, and I would like to at least give this applicant 20 minutes to uh, present, and I know we're going over time, but. I'm good for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your patience. Well, entertain a motion. Do we have, no, we, we voted to no, continue until, yep, yeah. thank you. Uh, one sort of question, do we need to discuss the um, Chamberlain Street? What, the Chamberlain Street? Um, we are going to, we earth. actually, before you got here, we elected to put that off until when Frank is here. He is missing this meeting because of a death in the friend family. Family friend. Family friend. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not a mad, matter of oh, urgency, so we did, elected to put it off to the next meeting. Since we're calling it Frank Durso Curve. Say it again. Since, since we're calling it Frank Durso Curve, it's just a joke. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Trying to so, keep it so light. Just, just so I understand, so basically because it's already been done, then it doesn't. Well, we wanted to know how it transpired, but it has been done. Yes. yes. So there's, right. There's no urgency in my mind. That's why the decision was made. And I'd love Frank for being here. And actually, um, as it happens too, Elaine will be here at the next meeting and she can speak to it even more completely. So thank you. If you would take a, a couple of minutes to introduce yourself and your project, um, we will have about 20 minutes to um, get the first part of it. And we have, um, we have carved out time um, in our very next hearing to continue with the both pieces of the project together. Okay, thank you. Sure, so my name is Denise Bartone. I'm from Eversource, um, the environmental permitting lead for the project. Um, this is a fire road for our existing um, LNG facility at um, 55 Wilson Street. And um, so what I'm gonna do is turn it over to Ty and Bon. They are our consultant for the project and go into more detail. I'm Tracy Adamski. I'm the project manager for Ty and Bond um, for both the LNG facility that we were here talking about last time, as well as for the secondary access road. Um, this road has a, is being proposed um, in response to concerns that had been presented by the fire department to provide an additional emergency access to um, the north side of the LNG facility. So we have uh, you know, worked with Eversource and, um, and the folks at the plant to identify a location for this access road off of um, Rafferty or uh, I guess Legacy Farm North Road. So we have um, identified where the wetland resources are. There's actually a stream channel that runs right alongside of the road on the south side of Rafferty um, where we're proposing. So we're actually proposing a stream crossing there. We're also in front of the Conservation Commission as well. Um, we've cited the access road to come off of Rafferty at pretty much the narrowest point that we could find. So there's wetlands uh, to the east and the west of the access road, but where we're proposing it's kind of a glorified drainage ditch. Um, it's, it's technically an intermittent stream because we do have wetland um, upstream of, um, of our channel. <laughs> so we, are, we have a culvert that's being proposed and it's a 20 foot wide access road um, to be gravel access road. Um, it's sized to be able to handle the fire equipment that would be coming in potentially and the only new portion really of the roadway is that north portion that extends off of Rafferty Road. It then, um, as it kind of bends, as it comes south into the site, it ties into an existing access road that exists. So there will be some modifications to that existing access road, but we're maintaining <coughs> the fence line um, in that location. We're not proposing any additional um, vegetation removal except for where we need it to come in off of Rafferty Road in that location. But once we come into the site, we're following the existing access road. And I'm here with Jean Christie, who uh, is the engineer on the project. And I'll talk a little bit about the stormwater for the project. Um, under existing conditions, there are a couple of culverts that do drain runoff from the I'll say the south side of the access road, the east side to the west in the north. 
Um, we are proposing to maintain those two culverts or replace the two culverts, but maintain the idea of conveying runoff at those locations. Um, we are in receipt of Beta's review comments and we'll be making some modifications to the plans. But one piece that, that we are looking at doing some additional work with is um, under existing conditions, there is a roadside swale that conveys runoff to the existing culverts. We're looking at extending that, cul extending that swale um, further along the road and using it as additional means of groundwater recharge and water quality treatment. So that's um, something you can stay tuned to be looking forward to later. Um, as Tracy mentioned, the stream crossing up at Rafferty Road, um, we did receive review comments from the DPW and from the Army Corps um, about that crossing with some suggested modifications um, in pipe material and in the actual cross section of what that culvert looks like in relation to the stream bed. So we are looking at relocating a little bit and reconfiguring that, um, that culvert to accommodate those requests. Okay. Phil, do you want to make some initial comments? Are we going to have Jill's okay. We just need to make space near the microphone. Do you want me to put up that on? Do you want to put up that on? Welcome. Hi. Um, I'm Jill Bokoff. I'm with Beta. I worked with Phil on the review for this project. Um, our concerns are primarily with increases in stormwater runoff and with the proposed culvert crossing. Um, I guess, first of all, since the gravel road that they're proposing is considered an impervious surface, Beta recommends providing a water quality swale along the entire length of the access road um, for capturing and infiltrating runoff. Um, we also recommend specifying a gravel with minimal fines to uh, prevent sediment migration into the adjacent wetlands. Um, overall, we're looking for more information uh, and calculations on the stream crossing and the culvert sizing um, to just better assess impacts. And um, the proposed access road, I just want to note, is down gradient of some of the existing culverts that Jean mentioned. Um, so the project shouldn't impact any of those. Um, we recommend including this cul these culverts on the plans uh, just to show that impact isn't going towards them. So that's it. Perfect, thank you. Um, just because it's getting late, <coughs> can we get comments from the public? Do you want to, anybody from the public want to, yep, come on up, Katie. Katie Towner, 9 Kruger Road. So, um, where is the culvert that crosses Rafferty Road, the existing one? Anybody? You can come right up and if you want to just, the way the meeting is structured, just sit right there, yeah. There's a culvert th located to the west of the site near where the um, wetland is. So if you can you see it on any of the plans? Yeah, is it not serving? The shore of the house. <coughs> right. Mm -hmm. There. <laughs> okay. Approximately. It, it Actually, goes I think it's the, the other further way. down. Has anybody measured it? Yeah, I thought you said oh, west. west. No, no, no. It's we have yeah. it on the. Uh, you have it on the east side of the proposed culvert. So, so we have uh, the plans for Rafferty Road. Mm -hmm. We overlaid it on this, and it's at that location. That so the. I know you, you had mentioned last time about the runoff when they discharge the... Yeah, the foam. The, the foam. foam, it goes across and goes into that wetland and it goes across the road. This is, this is I don't know, 50 feet to 75 feet um, downgrading of that. Through, through the chair, can I just suggest that the two parties sync up afterwards at the location of so, the current So that's one of our comments was to add it to this plan so okay. everybody would know where. So will that be changed at all by this? Does this plan have any changes to the existing culvert? 
there are no changes to the existing culvert. Under, under this roadway plan? That is correct. So the, the discussion of, of my comments about that in relation to the, um, I guess the, I had some comments about the, uh, the stormwater plan in general for the project. Mm -hmm. So is this different? Is, is this a different stormwater plan? Oh, this is the, yes, this is the road, not the um, e expansion, the project. But because at the last meeting, we talked about the liquefier project. We and did, and they're coming back at the next meeting, and this hearing will be continued to that meeting as well, so they will happen right. at the same time. Because my, my comments had to do with the, um, in, in one of their paragraphs, they say that, that they do indeed discharge stormwater to the Hopkinton Reservoir, but they don't identify the point at which they do that. Um, I believe that the, this culvert is a point of discharge to the, to the Hopkinton Reservoir, um, but I, you know, I would like to know what they think, and they don't say in their report. Okay. So, and also the, um, <coughs> The, the um, it's not clear from the report um, how many sources are contributing to this discharge. It sounds like this discharge through this culvert across Rafferty Road is coming from multiple sources, and it's um, being pumped out of the containment area across Rafferty Road. So um, anything that that drains into the containment area, any grease or oil or exhaust or foam, firefighting foam, and any other activities that they conduct are being pumped through this culvert across Rafferty Road. So I, um, I, I just think the report did not, um, um, it, it, it did not, it was not cohesive. It didn't, you know, in, like I say, in one point it said, yeah, we discharge stormwater to the reservoir, but where? I mean, there was no map to show how many outfalls there were, where they are, and and um, the I couldn't find any record of their practices with regard to the use of foam and the um, cleanup of it. It sounds like they just, you know, I mean, I I saw it once and took pictures of it and talk to the personnel at the gas company about it. Um, but I don't know how many times it occurred, and um, so I, I would like to know, you know, what their, what their ongoing practices are. Um, I didn't see any, um, <clears throat> you know, there's, I couldn't tell from their records or anything that, that it sounded like this was standard operating procedure when I talked to them as opposed to um, an incident, an unintentional release. It sounded like standard operating procedure. So I was interested in confirming that. Um, um, you know, if it's a continuing practice or, or if it's not a continuing practice when it, when it ceased. So I guess things like that, um, okay. I, I think that would, go a long way to completing the the report. I just thought the report kind of jumped around and 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 didn't really hang together. So okay, thank you. Does it uh, anybody else from the public? All right, does the board have any initial questions you wanna Is that one quick question? Yeah. This access road, how much access, how much utilization will occur on the road on the I'm going to have you come over to the microphone or folks at home if they're still alive. <laughs> My name is Jim Blackburn. I'm a project manager for Ever Sources LNG Group. Um, after constructed during the plant's normal operation, we wouldn't expect to use that road. Um, except for emergency um, access. Um, I think during construction of the liquefier project, 
Um, assuming that this road was installed prior to that, it probably would get some use during that period. Um, after which, uh, again, it would be, we'd have uh, at, at least a chain link fence uh, gate and then probably a vehicle uh, barrier on that side and, and it would not be normally used for, for much of uh, any activity. So I guess I misunderstand the initial discussion because I thought you said that you're going to use existing culverts and keep their use that way. So there are culverts there through the chair. There are culverts there now. There are culverts within the site, within the access road within the site. Oh, but not under the main road. Not No, we're not touching any of the, the existing culverts under Rafferty. The culverts were on the existing access road within the site. But through the chair, you will be building a culvert under Rafferty Road or? Not under Rafferty Road. Um, so there's a, I don't know if you can kind of see the wetland, actually maybe if you pull up the aerial, that might help again. It just kind of situates people. So the green <coughs> that you see on um, this, sorry, the, the green hatching that you see here mm -hmm. are the wetland areas that have been flagged. And there's the dashed blue line. That's the stream channel that runs to the south of Rafferty Road. The culvert that we're talking about will span that stream channel to allow the access road to cross the intermittent stream. So there's no okay. new drainage okay. road cutting across Rafferty. It's alongside okay. Rafferty. Okay, parallel to. I was thinking across. Yeah. yeah, it's parallel to. Thank you. And, and just real quickly, that upper left quadrant is not your property, that RB929 or whatever, or R829? That is a resource owned property. Oh, it is? Just or Hopkinton LNG out. Corp. It, it's just, it's a different assessor's. Okay. Wait, the one where Bay Path is? No, that's across the street, a little bit, a little bit yeah, further down. Oh, okay, but further down. Uh, no, Bay Path is on Hopkinton oh. LNG Corp property. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. They're a leased. They're on your property? So yes, they are. I think they're moving now, aren't they? At some point they said they were moving way back when, but anyway, I, I digress. I else, it was not true, so. I'm good, thank you. Okay, anybody else questions at this time? I have a question. Um, for outdoor drain, for facilities such as yours, what kinds of containment units are required for overflow? for safety of, say, a leak, or, um, and how is your, how is your facility with those kinds of requirements? So with the proposed project, so again, separate um, item, I think, in front of the board, but for the proposed project, all um, storage tanks, mm -hmm have 110 percent containment so we have the entire volume plus 10 percent of the liquid that's within that. So what that. happens is it gets contained within those giant things. That's correct. Um, so and those things those big tanks have drains. Oh sorry so the existing tanks you're talking about the LNG tanks the the three blue yeah. tanks yeah so so that has again 100 percent containment for each has 100 percent containment for one of the tanks one of any three vessels and that containment is that big area on the north side um, so it's an open area, area. it is mm -hmm. um what in regulations requires it to be so contained? Oh. We're, we are talking about the road, the access road. But it, it has to do with what I'm talking about because if that containment area drains out into the area that's of concern, is that the only containment? And is that because the road is right next to it? Yeah, you know? right. And so my question and concern is that. I've seen these big concrete tanks that are submerged and so that the gas flows down into these concrete tanks so it doesn't mix with other waters and liquids that come more naturally from the earth and can potentially get drained out. Has there been any of those kinds of provisions or does the state require any of those kinds of provisions from you? Um, so, so I'm not sure if I know. 
I'm not sure if I completely understand the, the, just, the question. Yeah. How, however, I, I will say so that the tanks are sighted um, with an LNG spill, it's a cryogenic liquid, so that would presumably drain to, as designed, it would drain to that, that containment area. So the properties of LNG is such that if there were waters or other chemicals in there, they would, they would freeze on contact with the LNG. The LNG is negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit, so they would, they would freeze. So that would bind them up separately. Um, second, secondary, with an LNG spill, if you were to take a container of LNG and drop it on the ground, LNG will vaporize, so it will boil off. So after that vaporization has happened, there is no product left. So it, it completely disperses itself, and so it doesn't leave behind an oily residue or anything like that. So if you're, if you're concerned about, say, like a petroleum product, like if that was an oil tank that spilled, that, wouldn't, that would leave behind a, a, some type of an environmental impact, whereas LNG doesn't have the same property. So but it would vaporize and go into the air. That's correct. That was my question. Yep, thank you. Okay, so I think we will um, continue this to, did you have quite an initial question? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I think a relatively simple one. I just want to confirm that the, the turning radius is coming off of Rafferty are sufficient for the emergency vehicles and any construction equipment or things that you, that you would be bringing in? You guys able to confirm it? Yeah. Yeah, so we had received information from uh, the fire department on what those radiuses and, and loadings would need to be, and, and our engineers telling me that they have confirmed that. Thanks. All right, and what time are we? Uh, 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock on the 21st? Uh, I'm sorry, the 15th. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'll entertain a motion to continue this public hearing to October 15th at 9 o'clock. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all. Yep. Don't forget your microphone. Yep.